when we meet House Tyrell, something that stands out right away is their abundance. They are fancy, and there's a lot of them. Loras Tyrell, the Knight of Flowers, canters onto the screen, decked out in armor and finery with his horse to match. Altogether, that quite likely cost more than Ned Stark's entire wardrobe, and he's a third son. When King's Landing, the largest city in Westeros, was starving, they brought food. Enough for everyone. I can't really fathom how much it costs to take up all the food burden for an entire city. A city! Seven dollars. Seven dollars. Seven dollars. That's less than I thought. All right, well, I can... (laughs) I'm going to start funding cities. (laughs) <laughs> and they didn't have this because they saved up. They didn't have to, like, max out their credit cards, you know? Let's not forget how much it cost to put armies in the field either, which the Tyrells were doing simultaneously while feeding all that uh, food to King's Landing. They've done 350. a lot. 350. Yeah, 350. Yeah, 350, you put an army in the field. <laughs> so 1050 is our total running cost so far. The Tyrells have done a lot of that throughout A Song of Ice and Fire and other times, and, of course, before them, it wasn't the Tyrells. And in between those times where war has been afoot, they simply stack up that wealth for the day when it does arrive. So they're always very well prepared for that in terms of money and food. With so much swag and wealth accumulated over the centuries, you'd think their home would be rather upscale as well. And you'd be right. To house a house like House Tyrell, there's Highgarden, arguably the most beautiful of all castles of Westeros and definitely the hedge maziest. That's right, it has a giant hedge maze, which will be one of our many subtopics today. It rules the Reach, representing the heart of fertility and the ancient traditions that have existed since the time of Garth Greenhand, a symbol of growth and plenty himself. Because it's not just the place they store all this wealth, it's how a lot of that wealth is generated, either directly or indirectly. Highgarden gets paid. One way we'll show the wealth of Highgarden is by comparing anecdotes about it to other castles, but we'll have a lot of other ways to showcase that, showcase that vast wealth. We haven't actually seen it on page, though there's reason to believe we will. We'll get into that. And there are a lot of descriptions and history given to us in the sources. I think Highgarden is likely the place that has the most off-page events occur amongst locations that we haven't actually been to. That gives us a topic as fertile as the region it rules. We'll dig deep into all that and more on this episode of History of Westeros podcast. Hello and welcome, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of our show. Glad you could be here, whether you're listening on your way to work or while doing chores or watching, or if you're here in the live stream, appreciate that. Let's have some fun. John, what do you... uh, what do you got in your in your cup today? Something high garden or fertile to uh, represent? It's a little more orange than yellow, but I was mm. trying to represent the Tyrell flower. This is the mango naked drink with the mango monster with classic Mountain Dew. Right on, right on. Not too strange for you. That's kind of ordinary, <laughs> but the color is not. That's neat. Certainly I- no soy sauce shot like last. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what so I saw. Oh, I'll be right back. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to our good friend Nina, aka Good Queen Alley. Her Tumblr blog is at Good Queen Alley with one L dot Tumblr dot com. She used to do something called House Words Wednesday for quite a while there, and every once in a while she'll fire that back up. And this is one of those times. She did one on House Elisham of the Paps, and it comes with a thorough description of why the Paps uh, would have the words they have and just some historical creativity and imagination and, and putting together what details we have. It's quite good. I recommend checking it out. And it contains a link to all her past house words as well, which is really fun because she's very attentive to detail coming up with words that fit. So it's basically she's done this with houses that don't have their own house words, which there's quite a few. So basically that's a way to fill that in, something to rest on until maybe george gives a official version but you know a lot of times nina's are better so (laughs) check that out this episode was voted on by patrons if you want to get involved in the voting you can sign up at patreon.com slash history of westeros next week is not a live stream we will not be we're going to be recording it in advance 
and posting it on Sunday at the usual time, but we won't be live. It's going to be on the Isle of Nath. Ah, Nath, the butterfly isle where Miss Sande is from. That one was not voted on by patrons. We snuck that one in there, but the week after was, was voted Nath on. I'm voted sorry. On. It was Noth voted on? Non voted on. <laughs> Noth voted on, yes. Depending on if you say Nath or Noth, I suppose. I, I, I kind of say Noth more often. <laughs> So this I is say Nath. Yeah. I learned Nath. I say Nath. <laughs> they have butterflies. They're not sheep. But that's the sound the, the butterflies make there. They're very strange butterflies. It's the week after that, we'll have the Neducation episode, which was voted on by patrons. That's an episode on the childhood and upbringing, a.k.a. the Neducation of Ned Stark. Time in the Veil, his... Looking up to Brandon, his protectivity of Liana, all that fun stuff. Little Benjamin mixed into. So Rickard, of course, will be prominent in that one. So that'll be pretty fun. You all voted on that one. Bigger. Uh, we had four suggestions there, and Ned won that one pretty handily. So, yeah, folks are interested in Ned's childhood. If this episode ends and you want to stay immersed with other episodes from our catalog that are related, we've got you covered. We'll have suggestions at the end along with the answer to the trivia question, which is, a Lord Hightower, we don't know which one, once claimed that the Red Mountains were green until a certain king invaded and painted them with Dornish blood. What king is he referring to? The first mention of Highgarden is where we will start, and with that comes a quote. She had never seen this land her brother said was theirs, this realm beyond the narrow sea. These places he talked of, Casterly Rock and the Eyrie, High Garden and the Vale of Erin, Dorn and the Isle of Faces, they were just words to her. We've quoted that one several times. That's Danny, of course, thinking about Westeros, which he's never seen, and big, important locations that swim around in her imagination. And Things that have been described to her. It's well, funny because hmm. she tells she really doesn't really know them because she says Cashy Rock and the Eerie, High Garden and the Vale of Erin. You really think you'd bundle the Eerie and the Vale of Erin together? <laughs> it's certainly <laughs> it's not Dorne and the Isle of Faces. <laughs> yeah, I know. The Isle of Faces really sticks out. It's like those are all big castles <laughs> or a country in Dorne's place or a part of one in Vale. And the Isle of Faces yeah. is just a little island. Still, really just words. <laughs> that's why they're all mashed together because she's only heard stories about them. She doesn't have the full context, so kind of works. Uh, in that sense, I wonder how fl that was really early, right? Was that Danny? I mean, it's her first one? chapter. Yeah, yeah. yeah like I wonder early. if George had it fleshed out in his mind that well, or if he purposely had her be inaccurate. You know? Yeah, yeah. Probably a little of both. You know? And so he, she's heard only descriptions of High Guard. She's never been there, and hey, that kind of, kind of similar to us. Now we've had a lot. We have a lot more source material to dig on. We're not just. We should probably do a better job of Viserys did driving Highgarden, who, honestly, he probably never saw it either. Viserys probably never went to Highgarden. He may have. He was seven-ish when they fled, so it's possible he visited there, but he would have been five or something. So, yeah, a lot of them are just words to him, too. So her descriptions would probably be pretty far off, given that. But maybe she'll see it. And maybe she'll burn it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. That is also something we will discuss today. Despite it being a place we've never seen, it is mentioned a lot. 165 times in just A Song of Ice and Fire. It doesn't count. World of Ice and Fire doesn't count Fire and Blood or Duncan Eggs here. So a lot. Yeah, Nina says the same thing. I think thing. it gets up to like 300 when you put them all together. Yeah, it's a, it's a really big number. It goes up a ton. So yeah, Nina says the same thing. We've, we're like Danny. We haven't seen it either, although we have better, <laughs> better descriptions. Now, the TV show version, we have seen it there, but it really doesn't look like the book version at all. Except for the location. The castle doesn't look like Highgarden, but they did at least put it on a broad forested hill surrounded by a flat grassy plain. So the, near, the nearby terrain, it looks pretty close to what it should look like, but not the castle. So, eh, you know, no golden roses for sure on the TV show. 
I realize another little clarification we should make too, not not to downplay it, but a lot of the mentions of High Garden in the book, like if you do a search of Ice and Fire, they're actually talking about this or that Lord of High Garden. It's yeah. not always a reference to the, the structure of the location. They refer to it as a force rather than castle. Like what will High Garden do? Yeah. And they're referring to yeah. the decision makers, not you know, the castle is yeah. it doesn't have some brain sitting inside but, making well maybe it does. <laughs> <laughs> But that's also kind of what we're going to do too, right? Yes. We're not just going to talk about the architecture of the walls. We're going to talk about the people in charge of it yeah. and the history of the culture and everything else. So. But we will mostly focus on the latter because the people are their own subject. Like the gardeners, we're not going to, this certainly isn't a comprehensive discussion of the gardeners or the Tyrells, but obviously there's going to be lots of them. Let's have the first mention of High Garden from the Those Bake Martin collection. So this is a George quote directly. High Garden and Casterly Rock are the two richest and most powerful of the great houses. The Lannisters have greater wealth. The Tyrells can put more men. Not only are they important to the story, but in real life, think about how much people gossip about the richest families in the world or the, just the people. Like Front page news is always like the f five richest people are always in the center of the news. Or Well, not always. I mean, the five richest Americans. There's richer people that just don't get in the news. But what, you see what I'm talking about. Same point. Gossip. People love to gossip about the rich. And that is part of why the Tyrells and Highgarden talked about a lot. The second ever mention of Highgarden comes up for us here as a description. It's, it's, it's very dis descriptive of not just the place, but the region. And it's very telling. Quote. You need a taste of summer before it flees. High garden, there are fields of golden roses that stretch away as far as the eye can see. Fruits are so ripe, they explode in your mouth. Melons, peaches, fire plums, never tasted such sweetness. That's Robert speaking to Ned, of course. Now, Nina had a great thought here. It might be Robert saying all this because they've been preaching the virtues of High Garden to him because they're trying to get him to set Cersei aside to marry Marjorie. So the virtues and benefits of High Garden are probably front and center because that plot has been ongoing as the scene happens. We don't find that out till later, but you know, we're all rereaders here, so we're able to look at this stuff and say, oh yeah, there's a little extra reason why Robert's so enamored with it. It's probably been on his mind a lot lately. He's even probably visited there recently because they're, yes, they're trying to sell Marjorie. And yeah, <laughs> it's all, go ahead, John. Even, even beyond selling Marjorie to him, like, I'm sure they have a plan B and C, like, okay, fine, Marjorie to Joffrey or, yep. uh, you know, Loras to Marcella, on and on. They, they want to play themselves up for whatever connection they can get in the royal family. Finally, it went Marjorie Renly. That's what they went with, <laughs> as we well know. Yep. That's what they had to settle on. Actually, they ended up going Marjorie Renly, Marjorie yeah. Joffrey, Marjorie Joffrey. <laughs> You're right. They didn't stop there. All those things happened, yeah. Thought about Laura Cersei. <laughs> <laughs> they did. They thought about all the Plan E, plan F, plan G. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of plans. It, also, that quote from Robert, though, it's the allure of the South encapsulated standing in stark contrast to the North, which has none of these things. And that's not really a big draw for Ned. He's not moved by exploding fruit in your mouth <laughs> or the descriptions of women certainly weren't making it any different for him. It certainly was for Robert. Robert's like, Oh yeah. Like they're all sweaty and they barely wear any clothing. And yeah. Ned's like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Just nodding politely. You're not really selling me on the place. You know, <laughs> it's not, that's not my thing. You know, Robert, how do you know me at all, Robert? And like, no, the answer is no. He, so High Garden and High Garden re represents the center of all that. All of that exploding fruit, <laughs> the fertility, the plenty comes from High Garden. It's the heart of all that. It all grows from that center. But it's also the heart of excess. It's also where too much. You know, someone like Ned is almost, not only is he not interested, he's almost turned off by all that. Like that, that kind of excess makes a person go soft. And he's looking at Robert when he's thinking that, who has definitely gone soft. It's like the forbidden fruit, in a sense, all that temptation of, of too much, of how having things too easy can cause problems down the line. Nina says it's also just straight up a reminder of the coming winter. Summer is fleeing. As Robert alludes to, he says, you know, you got to taste that. You need a taste of summer before it flees. First line there. 
quoted. And yes, yeah, so there's a lot of symbolism in that line and a lot of high garden in the center of it. Others are coming. They're already on their way, as you don't know. But that they'll get so far south that the high garden freezes over. But winter is going to affect it one way or another, even if it's not right in their face. You know, I didn't even think about it until you went down that line, but it's a good contrast of Ned's mentality or maybe the Northern mentality and Robert's. Uh, Robert's thinking like, oh, we got to get it while we can. You're right. Yeah. Like mm. immediate satisfaction, get this be sweetness before we lose it. Ned and the North is like, winter is coming. We need to be prepared for the tough times, right? Yeah. Not let's indulge quick while we can. Let's prepare for the future while we can. That's a great point. He says we need to use this, these fleeting moments to prepare, not to enjoy ourselves before it's gone out. Ned, being a Northerner, understands this better than Robert. Robert should understand it being king. It's all his responsibility, but Robert being Robert, it's not a surprise <laughs> that he's not thinking along those lines. Let's talk about the founding of it. Here is another quote to describe that. The great castle of Highgarden, ancient seat of the Tyrell lords and the Gardener kings, for them, sits atop a verdant hill overlooking the broad and tranquil waters of Mander. Seen from afar, the castle looks so much a part of the land, one could think that it had grown there rather than built. Many consider Highgarden be the most beautiful castle in all the seven kingdoms a claim that only the men of the Vale fit we start with location because that's the first thing that goes into a castle choosing where you're going to put it and it seems like that was a really really good spot and i love that description looks so much a part of the land one could think that it had grown there rather than being built that's partly true i mean it is as we go on to describe it further you'll see there's Nature is all ev everywhere, like cultivated nature, but there's trees, vines, and roses, and gardens just all over the thing throughout and inside and outside the castle. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it does sound really beautiful. I mean, I don't know that having seen the, the TV version of the, of the area is a lot more stunning, but the real life, real life, non book versions of these. I don't know it's a hard the hard choice not having certain see them but i imagine somewhat goes into personal taste you're totally right like yeah. if you like a, a a stark uh you know landscape and mountainscapes and and all of that and snow-capped mountains I, I, yeah you're gonna like the eerie more if you like a view like that but if you're like me and you would rather see just like greenery everywhere and like flower like yeah the high garden blows it away i choose high garden it's easy for me but i i can see it being hard for yeah, and they both have that thing, what high is honor and high garden, right? They're both secret. They're all secret potheads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. You would think that the Reach would have the best word. Yeah. <laughs> so High Garden is said to have been built by Garth the Gardener. Recall that Garth was supposedly the eldest son of many sons and daughters of Garth Greenhand, the mythical founding figure. Surely it didn't begin as the most beautiful. I mean, it was just a start and then over time it had to grow that way especially because the natural features of it you can't just build that like you plant the rocks and mortar and all that but the you can't make a hedge maze overnight that has to be grown you can't make a, a garden overnight that has to be grown right if they planted trees though those would have had to grow so if you're looking on screen if you're watching the video version of this we've got michael clarfeld's high garden it's really really awesome it's super well done he's paid a lot of attention to the detail if you zoom in you see statues you see colonnades you see uh, a sept you see a little bit of cracks in some of the foundations to represent the age some of those you see vines crawling up the walls you see a heart tree it's really it. of course the hedge maze looks fantastic michael clarfeld as always is such amazing work. beautiful and it, what's that behind you there oh it's yes just... the exact same map also <laughs> reach as well it's a little harder to make out but yeah I have high garden behind me it bears mention that high garden also predates the eerie by well we don't know <laughs> construction was began on the eerie by roland the first aaron grandson of artis the first who was the first king of mountain and vale 
So perhaps only a few generations, Artis and Garth Greenhand may have been, or, or Garth the Gardener may have been contemporaries. So maybe only a few generations, perhaps a few hundred years, though. It, it doesn't sound like a massive gap, but Nina says maybe the gardeners were, since the Ar the Aarons only came over during the Andal invasion, that would still, that would be thousands of years, potentially. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I, I forgot that Ar the, the Aarons were, were originally Andal, so that's a good point. So it's probably substantial. So maybe the Eerie, where they were trying to match, and that is what we're told. We're told that Roland uh, the first believed the Gates of the Moon, which was the original seat of power for them, was inferior to Highgarden or Castle Rock. And his wife, Lady Teora Hunter, in turn, inspired him to build the Eerie in order to match or exceed them. So, yeah, that, Nina says, that might also suggest that Highgarden was considerably older than the Eerie, that it had been well established alongside the also definitely ancient Casterly Rock founded by Lan or by the Casterlers taken by Lan rather so it does seem to argue for a pretty long period between those now arguing over which is more beautiful does seem like a dead end but as the Shea pointed out it comes down to taste but it also comes down to season right like if you're looking at High Garden in the winter when the golden roses aren't in bloom and a lot of that greenery isn't there the spectacular views of the Vale might jump up like especially given the no fall might even enhance it but yeah uh and that's neither castle really would be at its prime in winter neither so there's that too uh like any ancient castle it can't be looked at as a monolith it, well especially because it's many stones stacked on top of each other <laughs> so it's literally not a monolith <laughs> a multi-lith <laughs> a multi-lith <laughs> But like any ancient castle, like we see with Winterfell, there's additions and changes and variations and setbacks and jumps forward and mismanagement and good kings and bad kings, all sorts of things. One can only imagine, though, how overwhelmed Garth was when discovering the site or, have, or being, being told of it. We don't know who stumbled on it first, other than, you know, the children of the forest were there first. But uh, out of humans, we have no idea. It would speak for itself, though. Like I said, the location looks amazing. It's a hill. Surrounded by flat plain, like there's no other hills that match it in the nearby vicinity. So it's the tallest point in the region. And it's got the natural fertility that would be obvious to anyone, especially people of that era who lived closer to nature than people do in, in modern times, let alone in real world. The vantage point to the Manderley, right? Yeah, like the man, yeah, you could see really far. Like no one's going to sneak up on them with an army. <laughs> You're going to see it coming from far away. So it's hard. It's easier to approach, unlike the veil. But there's no sneaking up. There's no subterfuge. And Nina says this goes back to the foundational mythology, which has been at the heart of the Reach politics for thousands of years. The heirs to Garth Greenhand are not called gardeners accidentally. The name signifies the desire of this dynasty to style itself as the rightful successor to that legendary heroic patriarch who made this land who tamed it and made it into what it is who taught men to farm who taught them agriculture who taught them all the tricks of of getting making a living from the land and and not just making a living but prospering in high garden it's the best garden supreme garden the grandest of gardens the greenest of gardens. so and over time they have kept that title no one really doubts it it's just kind of a part of Westerosi cultural norm is the heart of fertility. It's never changed there. Climate is what it is. The got the best soil, <laughs> the best climate. That's not like to change even after a long time. Uh, Nina uses the term Garthian here in her writing, which I really like. <laughs> I'll try to find other term otherwise to use Garthian as a word. <laughs> Talking about uh Wayne's world. <laughs> yeah. I had a couple of quick thoughts too that, uh, you know, talking about like comparing high garden to veil, vale, for example, like, you know, the veil vale might be harder to get to, but it's harder to sneak up on high garden. But another factor is it's harder to get anything to the veil, yeah. right? Like mm -hmm. it's hard for them to give food. High guard is all around them. It's, it's, I almost think it's I, on some within level. The, within their region, it's not hard. Like going from the Erie to 
runestone. But yes, but from inside to outside or the other way around. That's the right. The, I'm yeah. just clarifying. Yeah, you're totally right. And, and I almost think I, you know, a lot of times you see these cool castles, especially like fantasy castles, real world castles. Maybe it's still to some extent have this challenge, but not as much as fantasy castles when they're like these tall towers and some isolated island or something. All I ever think is like, how does anyone ever leave that place or get food <laughs> in there? What yeah. do they go to the bathroom? Like, I just think about how many stairs you have to climb, like just the reality of how you would function in that building. And I, and I appreciate that George sort of addressed that. That they like, they just leave during the winter. They just, they're they just, just, leave, just yeah. don't live there. <laughs> no, it's not like yeah. someone's going to come take it. Like, it's you can't live there. And the, like, even someone who would come take it would just be like, yeah, let them have it. They're going to be leaving. They're going to discover <laughs> that you can't live Good there. Good luck with now. that. Yeah. <laughs> but High Garden does not have that problem, right? No, no it's 24, it's, it's 24 7, 365. Well, <laughs> that's probably not how many days in the year are in Westeros, but you get my meaning. But let's also think about the way that quote was worded. Um, part that's a quote within a quote looks so much a part of the land one could think that it had grown there rather than being built another word i've put here is the eldest son of a legendary greenifier he's a symbiote with nature himself i mean yeah this is a good example i think of tolkien's influence on george because this is very elvish this stuff these descriptions feels like the elves are one with nature in a lot of ways they don't cut trees down so much as encourage them to grow different ways and shape them and yeah, uh, which is a lot of a lot of like what's happening here, and Garth Greenhand certainly fits that mythos somewhat. And Garth, yeah, Garth literally made the land bloom, and you can think that he would apply that to the castle as well. So the castle is blooming too in its own way, which also adds to that sense of it growing directly up the hill. And that's true for a lot of these castles. A lot of these castles add their mythology to the founding myth. Like Storm's End exists as a direct expression of Durin God's griefs war with the gods and somewhat victory remembered and a hero. But let's get a quote of what it looks like now, because that'll enable us to you know work our way backwards into what it used to look like, since that's not as clear. Quote The hill from which High Garden rises, neither steep nor stony, but broad in extent with gentle slopes and a pleasing symmetry. From the castle's walls and towers, a man can see for leagues in all directions, across orchards and meadows and fields of flowers, including the golden roses reach that have long been the sigil of House Tyrell. Yeah, so since this place was so amazing, we have to think that the children of the forest and perhaps the giants were there in the old days you'd think they would have maybe cherished the place. But maybe not. It might, it might be assuming too much about what the children of the forest care about because they're not using it to farm, and that's part of what made it so good was uh, it was great farmland, right? And children of the forest don't care about farmland. They, they care about fertility, but they don't farm. So there's not quite the same. But either way, this, losing this locale, if they treasured it, it may have been particularly painful. I mean, see how valuable it was to the humans if it was that valuable for children or reverent or spiritual center or something like that. Some of the myths around Garth Greenhand include his failed attempts to teach the giants and children of the forest how to farm. Uh, those races rejected it. They didn't want to learn how to do that. They thought maybe like, maybe they're a little bit like the Dothraki who think that tilling the earth and all that is sinful. Uh, obviously, there's not many comparisons between the Dothraki and the children of the forest, but that is something maybe they have in common, although for all I know, the, the reasons why they reject farming might be very different. Maybe this is also an attempt, Nina writes, to justify the seizure of this territory from inhabitants. Certainly possible, though, in general, I don't know that humans care about justifying <laughs> what they've taken from the children. <laughs> I don't know that they see that as something evil. So maybe not, but still it might, it might do to make the myth a little friendly. You're telling children, I mean, their own children, not the children of the forest. Like you don't want their bedtime stories to be too violent. <laughs> you know, they still want to, still want to have some honor to it. You know? Right. Trying to be fair. It is, you know, humans aren't a monolith. They are also multi-liths. 
So there might have been some humans who were more mongering or greedy and just wanted the land and others that were concerned like, hey, this land belongs to the children. And someone might have pointed out, yeah, but they're not doing anything with it. Look what we could make here. Think of the food that we could produce on and on and on. And like, okay, I guess you're right. It might have been a method or a factor in the decision, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's true. In addition to the location being really fertile, the fact that it's on hill overlooking the Mander, that's a really great place to do be. The Mander is huge. It's the biggest by, in Westeros by several metrics. There's lots of stats you can put on rivers, length, depth, width, things like that, you know, how fast it runs. Several of those metrics Mander, Mander is first. In. We got another map shot on screen if you happen to be looking or watching the video. The, this is also enables them to control a lot of what's happening because they're kind of south along the Mander. So anything that wants to move towards the sea, if it's going to have to pass High Garden, anything that's coming up from the sea is also going to pass High Garden. So they really control the mouth of the Mander, even though they're not right on it. We have theorized, and you can see on this version of the map, that Dunstanbury, a former seat of House Manderley, there, that may or may not be true. That's just our guess because we don't know where Dunstanbury so it's entirely possible no one ever built a city at the mouth of Mander. And the reason for that would be because Highgarden wouldn't have wanted them to because they wanted to maintain that control for themselves. So, yeah, entirely possible. Either way, it's an extremely powerful spot, not just because of land, but because of that positioning on the river. That brings them enormous. It could be a, I don't know, it's a sister city. What Doesn't Castle Rock have like a nearby port that they kind of, oversee well not really Landisport is right next to castle rock and that's a full city and castle rock has its own port under the mountain but for example athens i've used this as an example before athens when it was a city state it's it's inland but it had a a port city that was part of athens called the piraeus and like 30 miles away so definitely not close uh so yeah you might you might be right they may have had some docks some like sister city that they didn't consider city but was owned and maintained and completely controlled by high garden that would make sense it would make a lot of sense let's now describe the castle's exterior or with that high garden is girded by three concentric rings crenellated curtain walls made of finely dressed white stone and protected by towers as slender and graceful as maiden. Each wall higher and thicker than the one below it. Between the outermost wall that girdles the foot of the hill and the middle wall above it, it can be found High Garden's famed Briar Maze, a vast and complicated labyrinth of thorns and hedges, maintained for centuries for the pleasure and delight of the castle's occupants and guests. And for defensive purposes, for intruders unfamiliar with them cannot easily find their way through its traps, dead ends, castle gates. Apparently, Westerosi just love white walls because a lot of castles have white walls. The theory is the castle of white walls had white walls. Um, Starfall has white has is white walled apparently. And Pale Stone Tower is Pale Stone Sword Tower is one parts of that castle it's not stated to be marble it could be i'm guessing it's not or they would have said so so even though the gardeners could probably afford it we don't know about any marble quarries near there we know there's some in tarth and some in the vale and we know that the marble of the vale was not cool enough for <laughs> the errands they outsourced their marble to tarth and got it from so it, it might be that marble is a little rare in westeros and so even the gardeners couldn't get enough of it or have the means at the time. Either way, it looks amazing, sounds awesome. Triple walls. Where else have we heard of triple walls? It's not the only place that has triple walls. Karth has triple walls. Constantinople in real in real life had famous difficult to take triple walls that I think it was what? The fourteenth Sultan that tried to take Constantinople finally succeeded, and it's because he had like the biggest cannons the world had ever seen. Deal with those walls. So, yeah, but such walls have certainly undergone, you know, maintenance, rebuilding, and they didn't start with three. 
right? They didn't start off with three sets of walls. They started with one, and then over time, it kept going and kept going. It really, the very start off wasn't even one wall, right? There wasn't, or am I mixing that up? Did it? I think they had no original? walls at first. Yeah. I think they yeah. didn't even have a wall at first. So they added one. I think the first wall was added when the Andal invasions. It's not clear whether that was the second or first wall. But uh, I, I realized when I said that just now that I was actually juxtaposing with. Uh, in my mind, I'm kind of equating High Garden to Versailles. Oh, okay. and Versailles started off as like a wooden lodge. Yeah. Originally. And now it's like one of the most elaborate palaces in the world. So, <laughs> yeah, and and that's how King's Landing started too. It started as like a little set of hovels and trade boats and egg, the Aegon Fort, which was made of wood, and now it's the Red Keep. Yeah, pretty. Uh, just goes to show how these things can grow over time. The hedge maze itself is pretty cool. I mean, hedge mazes are really expensive. We did a little bit of real world research on hedge mazes. Man, there. I mean, you can imagine they're expensive. It's just this giant garden. It has to be grown in very specific directions. It has to be trimmed frequently. There's so many different plants that have to be watered and fed. And there's paving stones that have to be managed so that the roots don't grow into them. And just, it's kind of insane to think about how much a hedge maze this size would cost to upkeep. Modern hedge mazes are mostly for fun. Uh, there's a lot of hedge mazes, especially in England, something about hedge mazes that the British really loved. I don't, I don't entirely know why, but mo I think most of the hedge mazes in the world are there. There's some that have been around for a few hundred years. They don't date back to super ancient times. Like the, as far as I know, there weren't hedge mazes in medieval times. There were labyrinths, which are not the same as, a, but fully green hedge mazes were, I think, a have only been around maybe five or 600 years. So it's, it's, that's probably why there's only, this is the only one we know of, I think, in all of Planeto. Might be some other ones somewhere, but they're not mentioned. <laughs> I think too, in modern times, just the knowledge we have of like fertilizer and, you know, irrigation pumps and all that kind of stuff, that they wouldn't have had that. Just, yeah. I mean, I guess maybe they would have had some method for like capturing rainwater around the castle and filtering it down to the maze, but it would have taken some ingenuity and or massive resources. I'm going to say maybe abusive labor even. To take. I just <laughs> imagine people like carrying buckets of water from the Manderley uphill to that maze. <laughs> <laughs> so a little more about the hedge maze later, but let's talk a little more about some of the general greenery around the, around the place with another quote. Within the castle walls, greenery abounds. And the keeps are surrounded by gardens, arbors, pools, fountains, courtyards, and man-made waterfalls. Ivy covers the older building, and grapes and climbing roses shake up the sides of statuary, walls, and towers. Flowers bloom everywhere. Now, Michael Clarfeld did such a great job of, on his map, but I really feel like this greenery is underrepresented in most fan art we've seen, because this sounds like it's just everywhere covering most surfaces and i think that's a lot more greenery than i think a lot of us have visualized ivy lives only about 10 years so it would be constantly regrowing and resetting itself and that would be the job of <laughs> the many gardeners <laughs> and i don't mean the kings i mean the people they hired because you know they weren't doing it themselves they got flowers everywhere. Grapes are just hanging there. I mean, they're just growing there. Imagine that. You can just walk along and have some grapes while you're taking a stroll. Probably good ones, too. We have some grapes, wild grapes growing in our backyard, but they're, they're called muscadines. They're not, not so good. They're very bitter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and weirdly, in Georgia, muscadines are, like, seriously regulated. Like, if I wanted to cultivate them, I'd have to, like, register. And, yeah, it's strange. The laws on muscadines are whatever. They're not terribly interesting. <laughs> so Casterly Rock is richer, but it's a cave, <laughs> right? It's it's a mountain. It's not it, you can't really compare it in terms of this uh, metric in terms of beauty. You want to compare it in terms of power and wealth? Sure. Uh, the Erie is also very far from where the food is grown. As we talked about, they abandon it during the winter because it's just untenable. Uh, they don't even stay there. Like, and. Nina once says, not to overstate this point, but think about how much this floral abundance would have done to help the gardeners assert themselves as rightful heirs to Garth Greenhand. 
the guy that everyone worships as the center of reach culture, they have his house, the place where all his virtues are espoused, the place where his, where he lives on, right? His fertility can still be found there. Everything seems to be growing plentifully there. Growing strong indeed, right? It just, the land speaks for itself. And in a world where people somewhat believe that the gods make these things the way they are, it sort of seems like the gardeners or the Tyrells have chosen, been decided on high, high garden, people are in charge. Uh, here's another quote that just continues to fill us with wonder and give us more history. The keep is a palace like few others, filled with statues, colonnades, and fountains. High Garden's tallest towers, round and slender, look down upon neighbors far more ancient, square, and grim in appearance, the oldest of them dating from the Age of Heroes. The rest of the castle is of more recent construction, much of it built by King Mern VI, after the destruction of the original structures by the Dornish during the reign of Garth Greybeard. We will certainly get to that anecdote about the Dornish and Garth Greybeard, but the tower's square versus those that are, quote, round and slender, it's kind of like looking back in time. We've been told plenty of times that round towers were a later innovation. That makes sense. Square is easier to build. Similar to Winterfell, right? But better kept. Winterfell has the ruined first keep and old tower that Bran loves to hang out at, but it's still ruined. Like the Starks never either didn't bother to fix it or they can't afford to maybe a little both. When it comes to high garden, it's rarely a case of, Oh, they can't afford that. <laughs> Especially given the passage of time, maybe they couldn't for a while, but give them a, give them a generation to stack up more coins. And all of a sudden they can afford whatever they can afford. I doubt any area of high garden kept. At least not right now. There have been times, probably, you know, we're talking about a really long period of existence, but for the most part, yeah, just they've always had the money <laughs> and people. I mean, they just have manpower, more manpower. There's more people to pay, let alone more jobs to do. Like the the staff at High Garden probably just orders of magnitude larger than the staff at Winterfell. You know, there's just more people there, and with more people, there's more mouths to feed, and with more mouths to feed, you need more cooks. Everything goes up in numbers, exponential. On some level, much like a lot of modern castles, it's as they're part like I don't know how to say it, museum. They're part culture, art in and of themselves, right? They Winterfell doesn't really care about their castle being impressive to the average folk. But High Garden does. Yes. Right. I think that they right. uh, are. It's it's part of their uh, identity, you know. Um, and they have enough abundance to maintain it, and it, it adds to their impressiveness. Where the Starks don't feel the need to add to their impressiveness. They're more established. The Tyrells are newer, and you know, mm, on and on, on, on. Yeah, and and Winterfell is a symbol of protection against winter. It is more. It is more of a fortress than like this. This I, I have it written later in the document. High Garden's like. It's not a palace, but it's like partly a palace because it's not, there's yeah. a lot of concessions to beauty with defense uh, sacrifice, but we'll get to that. But yeah, it's a great example. And Winterfell only has two walls, but it's got the Starks behind it. You know, they're just, <laughs> right, there's just a lot fewer people that want to take them on. They have fewer enemies and their borders are more secure. Like where are the invading armies going to come from when you're in the North? Other Northern houses back in the day would have been the answer, but yeah. It's just a very different consideration. And by the way, Winterfell has two sets of walls, in case I didn't mention that. <laughs> now, the first, like I said, the first wall of the three was built during the Andal invasions. As far as we know, I'm sort of guessing that. It might have been the second, but I'm pretty sure it was the first. So they just didn't bother before that. They didn't need it. They were strong enough without it. The wall was built by Myrne the second. Myrne the Mason, he was called. So some of the towers date all the way back to the Age of Heroes, it says in that quote. Is that true of the statues as well? That's an interesting question. We have some really old statues. I'm not sure statues can last that long, but maybe they redo them or maybe they keep them up so well. I mean, there's statues in museums that are really, really old, but they're not 10,000 years old, I don't think. But there is, you know, artwork that's 10,000 years old that's been found, like cave paintings and stuff like that. So it's possible that there are things that old. Nina has a great point here. 
bringing up Winterfell again, we know a good bit about the crypts of Winterfell. Certainly there's plenty of mysteries left. Well, we don't really know the, the Gardner or Tyrell burial practices. I feel like returning them to the land would make sense, given their virtues and ethos and all that. Burials, but they, they would probably still have tombs for the Gardner kings and the Tyrell kings as well. Those might be underground. Not be. They may have some spot for it. It'd be a big spot because there's been a lot mm -hmm. of Gardner kings and queens and Tyrells after that. So, yeah. But maybe like maybe that would be a one one place you could find disrepair in High Garden, like deep, deep, deep down in the crypts. But they may not even have crypts. You could see it though because they're on a hill. So you know, you know makes sense. Uh, you know, in terms of like talking about like what different dead. Yeah. I think it'd be so cool if people in the Reach or Tyrells or anyone like planted the dead bodies yeah that would be pretty cool yeah like expect it to grow out of like uh like what story was that the story that and had a lot in common with n seven times never kill man the uh orson scott cards ender's game that that yeah. uh that world yes there's that with the piggies they did their kill someone and the tree grows out of them it's part of their life cycle that's oh. like mm. influence on the uh concept of fairwoods and art trees Oh, cool. So yeah, that that would sound like this. Like they plant someone and put a, a, a berry tree on top of them. Which we saw Arya and and some of her friends after their all their after they were killed by Armory Lords and their men, they buried a few of their survivors. One of the Brandos they were with tossed some acorns in the grave so that a tree could grow to mark where they were buried. Because otherwise because they had an unmarked otherwise it's an unmarked grave. So that is a cultural thing. That's a thing that exists in where this is this random commoner just does this. And if like if anyone started that tradition, you might think it was the gardener back in the day. Like, yeah. I wonder if that random commoner was from the Reach. He might have been. Yeah. I, I don't remember his name. He we know his name. I think it was Kurz or Harbor or something like that. I'll have to look. I I didn't have that in the notes when you when you when you mentioned that a shade. I mean, pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but also let's not forget, given we're thinking about what might still be there, what would remain, we did have that anecdote about destruction via the Dornish. So a lot of things were destroyed and rebuilt. I'm not sure the Dornish cared about smashing the statues, but they might have bothered to do that. They, they can be brutal. You know, these wars between the Dornish and the Reach can be pretty nasty. So destroying all your stuff is is on is a possibility. And Nina says, yeah, and also intra dynastic disputes. The gardeners. Being such a fertile family, there had to be some times where there were civil conflicts between them where two different gardener claimants fought, and that may have, part of that struggle may have involved destroying the statues of that branch to maybe reduce their prestige or something. Here is another quote. Let's talk about how the gods are viewed here in High Garden. The gods, both old and new, are well served in High Garden. The splendor of the castle sept, with its rows of stained glass windows celebrating the seven and the ubiquitous Garth Greenhand, is rivaled only by that of the great sept of Baylor in King's Landing and the starry sept of Old Town. And High Garden's lush green godswood is almost as renowned. For in the place of a single heart tree, it boasts three towering, graceful, ancient werewoods whose limbs have grown so entangled over the centuries. They appear to be almost a single tree with three trunks reaching for each other above a tranquil pool. Legend has it these trees, known in the reach as the three singers, were planted by Garth Greenhand himself mm, and there's garth greenhand he's a very large <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's such a cool image the the idea of garth greenhand planting the bear woods and sort of blessing the site it may have been that those trees were already there if there wasn't a werewood there they definitely planted one I'm not going to build a castle in ancient westro archery come on that's how it worked back then i assume the dornish didn't burn the god's wood that's that's a normal thing. Like, the Boltons didn't burn the Winterfell gods would when they burned Winterfell. They're like, even we aren't trying to do that kind of evil. <laughs> We're not trying to burn the gods. Like, they're not that uh, 
gold. So the first step that Highgarden was built during the Andal invasion as part of welcoming them. This was by Garth the Ninth. And this was part of their strategy. Okay, we can't beat them, so we'll join them. Saying applies in Westeros. That logic still works. So they started marrying into them. That's basically how the Tyrells came into the play here. We'll, more on that in a minute. Nina says, even the godswood reflects the abundance of Highgarden in a seat literally defined and named by its floral growth and power. It might come as no surprise that the godswood reflect this. While where any other pre-Andal seat in Westeros might have had just one werewood, Highgarden has three growing together so intertwined that they seem to be one tree rather than three. So yeah, it just, it just, there's a, that's a, something they could point to and be like, yeah, we're, we're better. We have three. You guys have one. We're bigger. It's another thing that shows off the fertility of the place. Another feather in their cap. Also, it's just so interesting how Garth Greenhand just transcends both faiths. Like he's not part of the seven. <laughs> He's not even really part of the old gods. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's just kind of sits atop them both as a straddling point, uniting force. Imagine some vines connecting the two and he's those vines. But that only exists in the reach. Like, outside of the reach, they don't look at him like See him as a founding figure, but they don't hold him quite as high in esteem. Like, in the reach, they say Brandon the Builder is a descendant of, of Garth Greenhand. And in the North, they don't really say that. <laughs> They're like, nah. They just say that. So, mm-hmm. And, like, Nina wonders, like, who would they consider Garth Greenhand the equivalent of if he was, like, is he the father in the seven? He kind of fits that way if you're going to combine them. But it isn't really, it doesn't really seem to play out that way. Maybe he seems like a big fatherly figure, but it would be really interesting to get Sea High Garden because this is one of the things George would have to describe. He would have to come up with the artwork we'd see some of this syncretism in play in art sort of how we see the targaryens showing their art or the baratheon the hunting tapestries which show robert all successful and all these it would be like that but way older and representing those times setting up this long-term sort of triple religious scenario it's like the tree the three trees and they got three religions all represented by that I really liked Nina's point, um, talking about like seeing in artwork, right? I liked she she brought up the idea that art on the walls of the maiden and the warrior in High Garden would be likely to probably evoke imagery of Maris the Maid and John the Oak, respectively. Try to make them seem similar, yeah. Maris yes. the Maid being the maid and John the Oak being the warrior, yeah, yeah. It's a real that is a real point it does it fits super well making these figures similar to one another helps people accept wrap their head around the conundrum that, are we worshiping figures that aren't part of our religion <laughs> you know but it's it's really human we see that all the time in the real world we see there's all these versions let's just take christianity there's all these versions of christianity that exist uh and but a lot of people also worship certain saints or certain other deities alongside that, and it doesn't seem to be a problem for people. Pretty normal. Or if you even, I don't know, take it a step back or whatever, the Abrahamic religions are in a certain way more distinct or diverse and include many more different religions, but they all still have a lot of the same central figures, even if they're okay, yeah. a little differently, but they still are yeah, fundamentally still based on the same thing. That's a great point. Like, yeah, like Islam includes Jesus. They just view him differently yeah and yeah. judaism views him. exactly yeah they all he's in their books <laughs> but yeah. they look at him differently yeah that's a great point uh let's see where was it? so all of this is really important because high garden is a seat of power it doesn't just mean wealth populous fertile farms but power over religion as well they want to also control that aspect of things and be the leader They're like yep we have three weirwood we have the biggest sept we have connections to the to our own founding mythologies as well so they kind of dominate all three religions as well and high garden also stands above old town not literally but in in prestige and power which was the home of the faith until the time of the dragons so that's a long time for the high septon to have been living there and issuing his dictates and all that stuff they've been subordinate to high garden all that time there's been some there's a 
the first uh, Gardner King. There was a Gardner King called the God's Fearing. First member of House Tyrell to join with Tygarden and to marry into the Gardner family was Alistair Tyrell. And he was an Andal. So Tyrells are Andals. I think a lot of people forget that. But they married into the Gardeners, so they acquired the same bloodlines as all the other houses that have traced their descent back to Garth the Gardener. But as we'll see later, this is part of why a lot of houses think the Tyrells are above where they should be. In addition to adapting Andal religion and Andal customs like knighthood, they also brought in lots of Andal craftsmen. Andals knew how to work in steel, and the first men didn't. There's probably other things they knew how to do that aren't as well described. But they wanted to modernize, and they wanted to have crafts that were suitable for the new dominant race of Westeros, because the Andals were mostly taking over all the noble houses. So having goods to sell them and having your culture reflect this change made a lot of sense. So they once again, they're staying in the center of things. Cultural center, religious center, food center, money center, power center. Just seems like they always kept that in the center, meaning themselves. Geographic center? Geographic or... center, kind of, yeah, yeah, kind of. Certainly the center of the reach. Not, not necessarily the center of Westeros, but definitely the center of the reach. Now, one thing I'm not sure about, you brought this up briefly before, Sean, with the ports. Like, I don't know what kind of navies they had. We do know they had them, but that's one of those things that probably ebbed and waned and ebbed and flowed, flowed, uh, based on certain kings and their needs at the time. We know that they established the Shield Islands to protect them against the Ironborn, and that was pretty effective uh, until it wasn't. But <laughs> that it took till about now for that for them to overcome that. Let's talk specifically about the Gardner era. It took a while for High Garden to dominate the Reach. It wasn't an overnight thing, obviously. The castle grew, so did their domain. But over time, given their power, their wealth, they just overcame just about everyone in the region. Eventually, that expansion wore itself out. They couldn't go all the way into the west. They certainly couldn't expand into Dorne. And the borders with the Stormlands were pretty well defended by the Storm Kings. So for a while, though, the Reach was many kingdoms. There were like four kings, major kings in the reach. Before that, there were even more. Uh, and, and like the, all the other regions, the number of kings reduced itself until eventually there were just a few. Even in that era, we have another quote to describe their, how they stand above everyone. No seat in the Seven Kingdoms has been more celebrated in song than Highgarden, and small wonder. For the Tyrells and the gardeners before them have made their court a place of culture and music and high art. In the days before... See, he, he, stared, he, he looked at me. <laughs> when I look at her during a quote, it makes her laugh, no matter what. Uh, yeah, I know. It's because I said the word high art. It was the way uh, you said high art. I know. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. In the days before the conquest, the kings of the Reach and their queens presided... In the days before the conquest, the kings of the Reach and their queens presided over tourneys of love and beauty, where the greatest knights of the Reach competed for the love of the fairest maids, not only with feats of arms, but with song, poetry. Are you laughing at feats of arms? No, I, I don't even want to. I, let me just keep going. <laughs> but with, okay, Sean. Yes. Okay. Feats of arms, but with song, poetry, and demonstrations of virtue, piety, and chaste devotion. The great. The greatest champ. I'm so sorry. <laughs> the great. <laughs> it's only one more sentence. I know it is. I got this. I got this. The greatest champions. Men as pure. And the greatest champions, men as pure and honorable and virtuous as they were skilled at arms, were honored with invitations. We're honored with invitations. God, I'm so, I'm so <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm so embarrassed by this. We're making a blooper reel this week. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, I'm going to just say this last, but. Honorable and virtuous as they were skilled at arms, were honored with invitations to join the Order of the Green Hand. 
So the Order of the Green Hand is a great example of something that centers reach culture on High Garden. They do all these things to make you want to be part of it. They create this order that's like, oh, everyone wants to be a part of this. So you are you part of the Order of the Green Hand? You have to work to be part of it. It's something that you like children, young boys grow up wanting to join it. it and it's ruled by High Garden. It's yet another thing that they created that people want to be a part of that enhances their power and prestige and just keeps them just so locked in the middle, the center of power. Nina says, bringing up an example you brought up, Sean, or at least a location you brought up, there's almost a pseudo Versailles or proto Versailles quality to High Garden, and that comes through in this description of the acme of High Garden and gardener culture. What the gardeners seem to have figured out, at least to some extent, is that by placing themselves as the ultimate arbiters of chivalric distinction in the Reach, they could draw potential rival aristocrats to High Garden and replace political ambition with ceremonial scrambling. That's a really good way to put it. She said it better than I did. Basically, you're saying instead of them fighting to be at the top, they're fighting to be the best under High Garden's rule. So they, they create these tournaments and competitions and things that people want to excel at, but they're all for the greater glory of High Garden. And people are fine to go along with that because of all these other things that High Garden does to keep themselves at the top and put themselves so far ahead of everyone else. You know, there's even another, I don't know, value to that. that like the way you're framing it is a little, I don't know how to say this, uh, cynical maybe, maybe. but yeah. like it, it's an opportunity for people who otherwise can't get into the upper ranks, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when you have these very old That's institutions, true. True. there's no hope for upcomers to progress but here here's a new thing that you can be part of that you can make a name for yourself that you can make a difference and you know have a legacy for etc you know yeah and another good way to look at another non-cynical way to look at it is say look these are all people who have been taught to fight are are kind of ready to go like they're taught to be brave and virtuous in war and things like that having ways to practice war without actually killing each other i mean it's like an outlet for that violence that they're taught without with minimal actual harm being done to each other. And when war does happen, hey, they're a little more ready for it than they've been. And it allows them to establish rules of war that do make war a little less brutal. Like chiv chivalry, like war is bad, obviously, but you'd rather have a war fought between two chivalrous sides than two, I don't know, really brutal and angry and vicious sides that have hated each other for centuries. Like having that standard of behavior actually does help reduce the level of nastiness that happens better to just do away with it all but given that's pretty unrealistic you may as well minimize it and this is one of those ways you'd rather have a couple hundred soldiers and knights meet at a scheduled time in a battlefield and duke it out than have gregor ravaging the lands yes right? like, yes <laughs> like the, the pe keep the peasants out of it like what do they do what is there they're not part of this they didn't start it they're not going to finish it all they're doing is growing some food and sending it off, sending their portions off to you and eating the rest themselves. Yeah, it's just exactly. So there is there is a lot of value to these things beyond holding power and trying to be in charge. They do also, it does create stability. It is a good thing, especially after so long a time, they get to call on that as well and say, look, like just like in the North, people like when the Starks are in charge, things are good. When the gardeners are in charge, things are mostly good. There's... They're not quite as stout in their <laughs> in their view or in their with their heritage and all that. We like we talked about how the Starks. We have no examples of like drunk Lord Starks. There probably have been some, but we haven't heard of that. Whereas we do have some examples of that amongst the Gardeners and Tyrells. To be fair, when you're that rich and powerful, and there's just so much food, or <laughs> that's just a little more. There's a little more temptation when you're living in High Garden. I would probably drink more wine if I lived at High Garden than if I lived at Well. <laughs> also, uh, when there's such abundance, Allure can screw things up for a generation, and everyone's no one's starving. Yeah, right? you know. that's true. Winterfell is walking a little more of a tightrope walk with winter. They've always got to be, pretty much always have to be thinking about winter, whereas High Garden, they shipped all that food to King's Landing. Most of it just came straight from High Garden. Like, they just had that. <laughs> you know, like, geez, <laughs> that's a lot of food. So, yeah. Uh, so it also creates situations where they sort of have like hostages almost. You, you, you send your best and brightest to High Garden to train there and become the best, but that's where they're located during that phase. So if you have designs on 
usurping or moving up well keep in mind your your son or your son and daughter or whoever is uh, a page or a squire at high garden and that certainly stands in your way They're kind of a functional hostage it's kind of like what uh nina points out there's a little similarity here between the the, the new order of winged knights that's being formed uh, at the gates of the right now story that if that were to exist for the long term it would be something that a lot of noble houses would would fight over they're like my we've had five sons being in the, in the wing knights over our heritage like the darklands certainly are proud of having the most members of the king's guard of all time and littlefinger sees this the same way the gardeners did at least in some ways he's like yeah let's create this new office dale's gonna go nuts over this they're all gonna want to be a part of it and then we're going to have several of their sons at our side, and those will effectively be hostages. They're going to you know, use this as, as a, another lever to power. Could I say, I wonder, is there a house that, do you think houses would brag about having the most members of the Wall of Night's Watch? <laughs> uh, in the <laughs> North, maybe? Kind of, in but... the North, maybe, if they volunteered. <laughs> but I'm thinking, it's like saying, like, you're a house of criminals who are all exiled <laughs> up to the Wall. <laughs> <laughs> At one time, you might have bragged about it more, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah that's Centuries true. past, yeah. Not so much now, yeah. <laughs> We're told that the Peaks had a lot of prominence at court over the years in the gardeners nina says it's probably true for the red wines or oak hearts and tarleys and fossways as well but the peaks were one of the more powerful ones and they were a little closer geographically so they this may have they may have had a the inside track on a lot of this but seven peak queens have uh we're told were a thing over the but that's still over thousands of years. how many valleys <laughs> ayo the Oaken Seat is a very cool thing that unfortunately no longer exists. It was a living throne carved into an oak. And I don't understand why I haven't seen more fan art of this. It sounds super cool, but I can't, I can't think of it at all. I can't think of an image of this at all out there. So hmm, maybe that's an opportunity for someone. <coughs> Michael. <coughs> Michael. <laughs> <laughs> There is a piece of it in um, the world of ice and fire. Oh, there is. Okay, I guess yeah, I just forgot I'll about show that. It. I'll, I'll show it. There, there you uh, go. Oh, cool. That's it from the world of ice and fire. I do remember that piece. Nice. So this throne re represents a lot, or did represent a lot. Just like High Garden reflects Garth Greenhand and his the fact that his power is so deeply entrenched, literally rooted in nature and fertility and the birth of humanity. The first High King some myth cycles so this throne is like a direct call back to him considering it's a living thing it's it's more of a direct connection to the founder than a piece of stone carved into the seat would be I think. and this was unfortunately uh not didn't didn't last of course the, the, in that dornish invasion that we referred to earlier it was destroyed more on that in a minute uh, Nina has a great piece of headcanon here. We're getting into this setup for the burning of High Garden. All those plants everywhere. Consider how much flame that would be, even if even if the gods would destroyed. There's a house called House Bushy, whose uh, one of them was Ben Bushy. We see him at High Garden or hear about him at High Garden in Brienne's memory. Brienne was at High Garden when that cruel prank began. All the ones, all those. Knights trying to get Brienne to think they were into her and that whole thing. Ben Bushy was one of the ones that started it and was one of the first to approach her, if not the first, and was then one of the people that she wrecked in the tournament when <laughs> getting her revenge. Uh, her, she has a very clever head cannon here about this. We talked about the incredible. You might call it a hedge cannon. Hedge cannon. Oh my god, you're totally right. This is hedge cannon. Wow, how did I miss that one? Great one. So we talked about how there must have been and is substantial upkeep on the gardens, trees, and all that. There may be just one office or group dedicated to just handling the hedge maze. And that could be a minor noble house. It could be house bushy, right? Like hedges or bushes. So I don't know. You know like it could be like a house Cassell thing where they're the hereditary stewards of Winterfell. You know, these guys would be the hereditary stewards of the hedge maze. So 
Makes sense. I mean, the hedge maze is massive. House Bushy is right there. They're about as close to High Garden as House Cassell or House Serwin would be to the winter to Winterfell. So yeah, pretty cool. Good cat or good uh good idea, Nina there. And the sigil of House Bushy is a green wall, which is what those hedges basically are. They're basically green walls, right? So that's some really that's some well supported head cannon, right? <laughs> but earlier we talked about how it's there's some certain concessions to defense here. And uh, like we see again using the example of Arya and Joran being assaulted by Amory Lorch. Remember they hold, held a uh, hold up in that little mini castle and when Armory told his men to attack men were climbing those walls with bare hands because there was roots and vines. Easier for them to they didn't need ladders. They could just everyone could just start climbing and with so many people climbing at once it was really it was really hard to defend the walls. So think of that. If someone's attacking High Garden, it's easy to climb up relatively to, say, Winterfell or Erie. Like, come on, that's really difficult. But on the other hand, High Garden would not lack defenders. They would have a lot of people on those walls, so that would help make up for it. And the triple walls, even easier to climb. That's still a lot of climbing. <laughs> and, and maybe not. Maybe one of the walls is kept vine-free or something to get that less defense, more defensible spot. But still, it comes back to what I was saying about this place being at least half palace or maybe maybe one-third palace versus castle. <laughs> they could, Go ahead. They could get them good if on the lower sections of the wall it was sturdy wooden vines, mm. but when you get higher up, it's like more green, weak vines, so they get to the top and suddenly it breaks and Yeah, they, they do back. that as a trap. They like lead them yeah. into climbing. Like, oh, hey, up. climb on up. Yeah. Look how easy it is. <laughs> <laughs> I like that a lot. That's a good idea. That's clever. Here's another, another thing we should consider with defense is, well, if you can't storm a castle, a lot of times what you do is you starve it out. You besiege it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Imagine doing that to this castle. That does not... Starving out High Garden. that doesn't really compute. A sentence does not make sense. <laughs> Stannis and his men started eating boot leather when they were being starved out of storms. Well, and now they're doing that again <laughs> in the north <laughs> as they're being starved once more. In High Garden, they literally have food growing on the walls. <laughs> like literally, like what someone could, an invader could be climbing up the walls and be like, oh, a snack. I'm going to eat this <laughs> as I'm climbing for extra conquest energy. You know? I like the idea of them planting some poisonous stuff. There. <laughs> 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 yes. Poisoned peaches on the walls there. Mm. Yes. <laughs> so that's uh, despite being far less defensible, though. It seems like the biggest factor here is just how daunting it would be. Like, who does that? Who takes on High Garden? Like, who has the strength for that? Like, they're so rich and powerful and fertile and have so many soldiers. Like, when the West and the Reach go to war, it's not one trying to take the whole thing. Like, Lan I, I don't know of a Lannister king ever reaching High Garden or even wanting to. When a Lannister king invades, they're trying to carve off part of the reach to, to make it the West. So it's a border territory, not the center, right? <laughs> that's not really feasible. I mean, so that's the bottom line is that. Or Highgarden, is it? Or is it? That's the bottom <laughs> line. Highgarden, at least history tells them that very few are even going to try. Like their best defense is just who they are and just the mountain. It isn't a literal mountain, but the mountain you'd have to climb that you in to conquer it and then hold it afterwards yeah i don't think so so while they have all this luxury that gets in the way of defense defense from what <laughs> right like in reality they're not they're very unlikely to have anything to defend against unless we cast our eyes towards the current story but even that what are they defending they're not gonna that's not any good against a dragon right <laughs> so there's means around that anyway so, and Nina says, this is part of the point. They keep it that way because it also expresses that confidence. They're like, look, we're the center. Who attacks the center? We're the heart of the reach. Who attacks the heart? Who can take over the heart? We're too powerful. But I just used examples of near neighbors like Castor the Rock of the Erie who have conquest in mind, not of High Garden, but of High Garden's territories. There is an enemy that doesn't have that consideration isn't trying to take parts of the reach for themselves. When they come through, they have an entirely different attitude and they have entirely different goals. And that's the Dornish. 
High Garden, unlike Casterly Rock or the Erie, cannot claim to have never been taken by an enemy army. Even though it's got all this defense, both indirect and direct, it has been taken. At least once. And here it is. Sack of High Garden. Under the reign of Garth X, a.k.a. Garth Greybeard, the Reach went to war with itself. He was a really weak king, no sons, and the lords who had married his daughters, Peak and Manderly, started fighting. They both thought that their, the daughter they married should be the one that became queen. Garth was also a terrible king in the first place. But at this point in history, it was worse because he was also senile. So bad king, king who had become senile. So really weak. Maybe perhaps the weakest king of Reach that we know of. Certainly the longest running weak king. Usually weak kings don't last, but this one actually did. Partly because people were ruling through him. Rule through somebody, you have incentive to keep them there, so you can keep doing that. And he lived a long time. So while the Civil War raged... The Storm King and the King of the Rocks said, hmm, this reaches the war with itself, you say. Well, this is the perfect time for us to carve off territories for our kingdoms, which they did. Then two Darnish kings were like, hmm, plunder, revenge, blood. Yes, our enemies. One of them besieged Old Town. You don't actually hear what happened. With that. The other sacked High Garden. Wow, like they actually sacked it. Very thorough sacking. We don't know when this happened, but it was probably very long ago, thousands of years. Because this was Garth the Tenth, and Garth the Ninth, son Merle the First, was the first gardener king to worship the seven. So that's a long time ago. I mean, not. not it's possible that the span between Garth the Ninth and Garth the Tenth was a long, long time, but probably not thousands of years. So. And even if it was thousands of years after the first gardener king to worship the seven, is still thousands of years or a thousand years, perhaps, before current time. So, anyway. We also don't know if all three sets of walls are in place. Certainly, if, it, if they weren't, this would be incentive to build another set of walls. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, all right, well, that wasn't enough defense, you know? <laughs> Garth was found tied to his bed and covered in filth. Dornish just put him out of his misery. They took all the wealth they could, which was, I mean, hot, right? It had to be just an absurd amount. And then they burned the castle. I mean, the flames were probably immense because of all the vines and trees and plants covering everything. Again, they may have not burned the godswood. Either way, it was a tragic amount of destruction and devastation. The oaken seat was chopped into little bits and burned as well. I guess it couldn't burn the way it was. It was too moist <laughs> to burn normally. Maybe they just wanted to chop it. You could just imagine yeah. a bunch of guys with swords like tearing it up and they're yeah. like, all right, now let's burn it. Get some ha axes, hack it to bits. I bet some pieces were taken as trophies as well. I probably didn't burn mm, every single yeah. scrap. If there were any artifacts or items which could be associated with Garth or his children, they may have been the kind of things they took as trophies. Iron crowns, bronze crowns maybe, just any sort of belongings to the old, to the old Gardner kings of the first men era. That would have been taken or destroyed by the fires. So 10 years of war followed. While High Garden was just a burned husk. Uh, and the only time we ever know of this happening where it was just empty, but the high steward, Osmond Tyrell, Tyrell's doing great work. He foreshadowed the role of his house later, he united the reach under the houses that were sick of peak and Manderley tearing the place apart. They got the peaks and Manderleys back into submission, made them bend the knee and restored the gardener line with a distant cousin of Garth, the 10th who ascended under the title, or name rather, Mern the Sixth. Uh, Nina wonders if they tried to rebuild the Oaken Seat or recarve a new one or just said, you know what? There's, a, there's negative implications of an ancestral throne uh, given some of the history to it. Maybe they decided not to, but I don't know. We, we haven't heard whether they rebuilt it or not or they couldn't rebuild it. They said there's no, there's no replacing that. We about it, but we don't know if anything took, its, anything took its place. It's probably some sort of seat. After all, Mace Tyrell, Kevin, in Kevin's chapter, he's like, look at that ridiculous chair Mace Tyrell brought to court. <laughs> <laughs> so we're supposed to believe he doesn't have a big chair for himself back in his, his own castle? Yeah, probably not. He probably got some really fancy seat there too. But it's oaken seat-ish, the thing that Mace brings. is like, Kevin even thinks that's vaguely throne-like. He's like, it's a little too throne-ish for his taste. You know, Mace, what are you doing, bro? A little too... To, uh, highfalutin 
So when sufficient time passed, the Reach had its revenge on Dorn, but that's a story for another time. It took extraordinary circumstances for all that to be possible. For the for High Garden to fall, you had to have a weak king and civil war and invaders and successful invaders and you know the civil the civil war reigning for so long that it weakened things. You yeah, just a lot of different factors had to come together for that. Kind of like how the Boltons overthrew the Starks in A Song of Ice and Fire. Like, in most eras, it would have been unthinkable because, like, the Boltons are just too weak to do that. Like, how are you going to overthrow the Starks? Like, they're so entrenched, so loved, and so powerful. So it took many factors to enable that. Things that Roose Bolton brings up, like a boy lord being in charge, civil war happening, multiple other events, multiple alliances being possible, the ability to have the Red Wedding. Just lots of things that just aren't very likely to happen. Especially all at once. Any one of those things by itself is unlikely and wouldn't have led to the stars being overthrown. Yeah. But all those things happening in the same time is, yeah. Yeah, and and, tech, and, uh, and they probably won't, in fact, be overthrown, you know, by the end of the series. They'll probably be back. Yeah, yeah, charge, yeah. So. Even still, it probably doesn't stick, you know. Which and is what happened Dornish here. didn't overthrow Highgarden. They just sacked the castles. So. Yeah, they, they, they overthrew it temporarily, which is also what seems to be going to happen by the end of Song of Ice and Fire. Winterfell will have been temporarily. Which brings us to the point. These are exceptional times. We are in the type of landscape where High Garden could fall again. Kind of unthinkable in most eras, if not all but a few eras. This is one of those few. You've got the potential for civil war in the Reach with the so-called friends of the Reach that may side with Aegon over the Lannisters and Tyrells. You've got a house that's not as popular as the Gardeners. There's people who will be happy to overthrow the Tyrell. You've got just weakened realm. You've got the potential of the others invading. You've got the potential of Daenerys invading, all these things that can weaken it. So, And you've got a bad Reach. leader, Mace Tyrell. <laughs> and the Reach has uh, given up a lot of value to King's Landing, too. Like that's a lot of their true. fruit doors and et cetera. They're, they're their trying to not just hold everything. High Garden, they're trying to hold King's Landing. That's a great point. Yeah, so they're spread thinner in addition to lead weaker so a lot in other words a lot of the same conditions are in play now so we'll examine more of that in the second half as we bring it into the modern era the tyrell era take a quick break here before we do that lady bela says as a gardener garth may has may have been seen as a manif manifestation of the smith okay yeah that's a little true like there's a little bit of the father but there's also a little of the smith because he's the growth and the industriousness of fused with nature it's, it's sort of a different element but the same role yeah, because they do nature smithing, right? Like the oaken seed is a good example. Of yeah, that. like that's a chair, a living chair. I mean, that's so and that's not a, the job of a smith, but it is human in people working on. Flippy dippy doo sends a crackpot theory: planting the trees could actually mean Garth sacrificed the lives of three people. Uh, like a because you know the plants are called the trees are often have singers in them, either to do the tree or to create the tree. Yes, I love it. I don't even call that crackpot at all. I think that's... We even talked about the possibility that a body was buried and a tree was put on top of it. That could have been a sacrifice. And then there could be f further sacrifices to those heart trees to grow them afterwards. So I think that is a big yes. Two thumbs up on that theory. Okay. Uh, tonight on Twitch, it is Sunday night. So if you're catching this later... I would recommend to you that you check out Ashea, who's going to play some, what is it, SF6? Yes, that's Street Fighter 6 mm -hmm. open beta. Street Fighter 6 in beta. It is, yeah, an open beta just this weekend. It ends tomorrow morning, the beta ends, but then it'll be out in two weeks and I'll be playing more. But yeah, we need to do a certain amount of streams on our Twitch channel to unlock certain features. So in addition to Aziz doing his Fridays at at 6 p.m. Um, Crusader King streams, uh, I will also throw in a few fighting game streams. I'm going to be playing uh, with Dom of Folkwise, and uh, it should be a really fun time. I You'll probably hear me swear a lot. 
because it's Twitch. I'm allowed <laughs> to swear. I can't say the words on our YouTube channel that I say when I stream. I play <laughs> these games. It's just gonna, gosh it, darn it. That's that's not what it's gonna be, Sean. It's gonna it's gonna <laughs> seven be, hells. Seven hells. <laughs> No, she, uh, when she gets really mean, she says eight hells. Ooh. <laughs> she increases eight the hells. hells. Yeah. Oh, and we got our first super chat from Davey Mac. Thanks, Davey. If you have any comments, feel free to add them and we'll, we'll grab them later. But if you just wanted to say hello, then that's nice too. Appreciate so also you. a shout out to our good friend and patron supporter, Jordan Reynolds, a.k.a. Uh, a long expected soundscape. And in the he, chat right now, he's in, in the chat right now. Excellent. Okay. Well, he just helped his... me with an audio thing. Oh, in well, fact, thanks for that. Jordan. Very helpful. Jordan has been working on an audio experience for you to put on while you read the Lord of the Rings books. He has been working on his project, a long expected soundscape for the last year. And the time has come. The fellowship collection is available now to purchase with the two towers and return of the King releases following later this year. He has written an original score designed sound effects, recorded amb ambient environment, sounds of nature, and put it all together for you to experience in individually designed tracks for each chapter. So let's break that down really quickly. The average chapter length in Fellowship, if you go by audiobook, is an hour long. That means in this Fellowship collection, you get 10 hours of original music. You can use it for other things too, like playing D&D or just reading other books or working. I've listened to it myself. I wrote not this episode while listening to it, but one of two or three weeks ago, I forget which one, but one of the recent episodes, go to jordanrannells.com slash shop today to purchase a long expected soundscape and use the code how 25 to get 25% off. That's J O R D A N R A N N E L L S two uh, N's and two L's in Reynolds. There's also a link in the live stream chat. If you're watching, you can just click that link. Yeah, so he just released the Two Towers yesterday, apparently. So that's really great timing. And the soundscape is actually going up in time. So that he, he's already expanded it since he, he sent us that, that uh, thing to read. So it's actually a little longer now. <laughs> so anyway, that's pretty cool. And uh, y'all look into that. He's uh, obviously been helpful to us. And his, his project here is, is very worth looking into. I can vouch for it myself. Okay, moving on to the Targaryen era. Like I said, that burning of Highgarden was probably a long, long time ago, thousands of years, so it had plenty of time to regrow, literally, and rebuild the parts that couldn't regrow naturally. And we're really not sure how much time passed between that and the conquest. But as, you, as usual, the time period just before the conquest is not super well documented. There's a lot of, we do, we, we've worked on that before. We have a series of episodes on that for the North and eventually we'll probably do the, the other regions, but yeah, uh, George left some of that kind of open, I think to keep the past a little distant or to leave it open for future development. It also makes sense that a, a big change like that would be more well-documented than just the random ongoings of regular times yeah, that led up true. to it. And there's more documentation on the era is like to be lost in a time of war. Yeah, it's probably when the Dornish burned all that, there were probably some records lost, even if they preserved the gods would. Dornish they... would never. <laughs> <laughs> okay, never mind. Moving on. Yeah. I'll burn you too. <laughs> Nine hells. <laughs> Nine hells. <laughs> Speaking of, the Field of Fire is our next topic here. <laughs> Saw the complete extinction of House Gardner and the death of Myrne the Ninth. Well, by complete extinction, we should say complete extinction of all the males. More on that in a second. Before he could escape back to Castle Rock, the Lannister King of the West was captured and he bent the knee to Aegon, which is why he's not called King Loren in this quote. Lord Loren's bannerman followed his example, and so too did many lords of the Reach those who had survived the dragon fire. Yet the conquest of the West remained incomplete, so King Aegon parted from his sisters and marched at once for Highgarden, hoping to secure its surrender before some other claimant could seize it for his own. He found the castle in the hands of its steward, Harlan Tyrell, whose forebears had served the gardeners for centuries. Tyrell yielded up the keys to the castle without a fight and pledged his support to the conquering king. In reward, 
Aegon granted him Highgarden and all its domains, naming him Warden of the South and Lord Paramount of the Mander, and giving him dominion over all House Gardener's former vassals. So there would have been Highgarden, I mean, Gardener women, princesses that lived, but they were all displaced by Aegon's decree, making uh, the Tyrells the new High Lords. So that would have certainly was part of his thinking to keep someone from marrying Gardner princesses and trying to restore that line uh, or claiming High Garden through that. So what a rise, though. You don't normally go from High Steward to High Lord of the Reach. I mean, that is not the normal path to power. <laughs> Usually High Steward is the highest you go. Uh, it seems like it should be more of a path to power, though, honestly. Uh, you, yeah, and you'll, I can see why you're, why you're saying that, because one of the reasons it was a shrewd choice by Aegon is that this is the house that's been running things. Like, yes, the gardeners have been issuing decisions and making the tough choices, but the day-to-day -day operation has been the Tyrells for thousands of years. They're bound to be really good at it, right? So that's who he put in charge. That's what he needed. He's like, yeah, keep this place functioning. Keep churning out the food the taxes, the soldiers when I need them, keep doing that. If I place it in charge of someone Stability, else. Stability. Yeah. Et cetera. And, like, the, the other usual options are the firstborn male. What the... Get out of here with that. <laughs> yeah, or yeah. someone fought better. Someone was more violent. You know, why are those the things? How about the person who's effectively, productively running things? That seems like the what should be the more <laughs> common, appropriate choice for leader. But the, the cleverness of that of this choice goes beyond that because House Tyrell would be motivated to stay loyal to the people that put them in charge because the Reach didn't like the choice. The Reach is like, oh, you put the Tyrell, you put the stewards in charge? What? They hated that. So it turned their anger against the Tyrells and not against Aegon. So, and the Tyrells know that. So the Tyrells are like, well, we have to stay loyal to Aegon so he'll back us up in case the Reach tries to take us out and knock us down. Like, well, as long as, as, long as the dragons are behind us, that's going to be really hard for them to do. They may not even try. You know, so it's a real, it's a two-way street there. Get knocked down, get up again. <laughs> <laughs> Never going to keep the Tyrells down. No. Nina points out a, a, a somewhat straightforward real-world comparison that for the Tyrells. The House of Stuart in Scotland literally became the High Stewards of Scotland. Stuart became the Stewards. Yes, that's right. Good mm -hmm. punning there. History. <laughs> you thought of a different Scot. I don't know if this is a good time. I don't know if you have a part in the document, but you talked about some other Scotland uh, comparisons for High Garden, didn't you, Sean? Yeah, I don't think we worked it into the document, but several times I've thought it might be a good moment to bring up. But there is a castle in Scotland called Dunrobin, which, first of all, just it just looks a lot like High Garden. Look I don't know that. how able you are to get the image up they're, there. They're on, now. Right now. they're on right now. There's it's hedge like maze white walls <laughs> with a hedge maze. And I think it has two outside walls, not three, uh, but it's just very, very similar. So much so I can't help but suspect that Martin might have had it in mind. Um, yeah. I, 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 physically, at least. Um, it's got greenery I, I, on the walls and everything. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. Castle Dunrobin in Scotland. Yeah. So, yes. More and Scottish it's, comparison. And it's mazes. I think it was built farther uh 1400 ish um but they put the mazes in around 1800 inspired by the french mm -hmm. and i was already kind of thinking that there are these parallels to like the reach and france oh, yeah. uh, nothing's exact or perfect but there's a lot of parallels between the reach in general and france and i was thinking that that high guard maybe is kind of like versailles and old town is kind of like paris mm, um, uh, yeah and uh and and uh, on top of that there's a, a some real Game of Thrones esque stories in this castle. At one point, it was there were a lot of different claimants, right? So you, you can you know the, a, a common uh, thread. And one of them, uh, man, I forgot. I'm pretty sure his name is Alexander. Give me two seconds to make sure I get this right. Uh, Are you uh, yeah, Alexander had had taken the, the castle, and they the Brooks or you know shoot, I forgot who it was, but took it back from him. And then his son came to, and by the way, they took it back from him and put his head on a spike on the castle tower. So then his son comes back to try to retake the castle and is killed in the gardens on the way up trying to assault. So <laughs> that, that some amount of effectiveness by the hedge mage there as a defense. But nice. <laughs> I thought the, both the physical appearance and some 
some of the stories behind it were very Game of Thrones esque, and, and, and it adds a little bit to the French parallels of the the cities that it might represent. So. I like it. Yeah, you, you're you're onto. I think those are great comparisons. I, I certainly am not aware of any better real world comparisons. And we know George has been to the to Hadrian's Wall. Uh, that was his inspiration for the Wall, and uh, one of the other. Manderley Castle, one of the Manderley Castles is, is also rooted in that history in that area. So yeah, why not? Maybe he saw this one too. Or has at least seen pictures of it. So part of the motivation uh, for House Tyrell to stay loyal was I've just explained, but this comes up immediately because the conquest isn't over. So Aegon he wasn't trying to kill everyone at the Field of Fire. He was just trying to wipe out the gardeners, probably. He, that may have been very highly targeted. He may have been like, all right, Balerion, see those, those hands on the banners? Make sure we wipe out all those guys. The rest we want to leave because we want them to be our soldiers afterwards. We just want to wipe out their leaders only. So I feel like this was not an accident. It's not a coincidence. Now, normally, if we return to the Field of Fire for a minute, normally... You are trying to, when you're, especially when you're a conqueror, you're not trying to wipe out all the enemy soldiers. You're trying to wipe out as few as possible. You're trying to beat the army, maintain as many of those men as possible so you can make them yours. You t he wanted to turn around and take those men, beat them, and add them to his army. He didn't want to slaughter them. Or even if you don't necessarily immediately add them to the army, you still want them to go back and work the fields, right? Every, what good yeah. is this land you take if no one is farming it or whatever? So Every single one of those soldiers lined up against Aegon and his sisters as a potential taxpayer. Right, yeah. productive peasant. Why do they want to kill that? They want to. They want to, you know, rule that. So, only like Shawna, you you pointed out, only like five thousand of the forty five thousand men, which is a lot of people, but forty thousand survived. So that's a, that's most of them, overwhelmingly. Even though it was a, a ninety percent about yeah, even a, a huge beatdown of a battle. But most yeah, that was considered survived. like this devastating massacre, right? Yeah. <laughs> But, 10 percent of the people. But a real massacre, or maybe not a massacre, but a real loss of men happened when Aegon ordered the Reach armies and his other armies into Dorne. And Harlan Tyrell, this very steward who surrendered to Aegon and became High Lord, led that army into Dorne. They went to the Hellholt and then they set out across the sands and vanished. The whole army. That so that's way more 100%. devastating. Yeah, that's yeah. way more devastating than the Field of Fire. So when Aegon l lost Dorne, right, he, it, it kind of like Daron the First, they submitted and then they immediately broke free as soon as Aegon went back home and rebelled. That's basically what happened here. And Aegon was mad. They, they murdered his counselors. They murdered his, you know, a lot of his men. And he's like, he goes to Theo Tyrell, the new lord, the son of Harlan. He's like, all right, let's raise another army and go back in there. And he's like, we don't have another army. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> literally the whole army vanished. Like, I don't know about that, man. <laughs> Aegon is like, okay. He, he accepted that. And that's when they instead decided just to go burn the castles one by one <laughs> instead of uh, enduring, instead of taking an army there, which also didn't really work but you know back to lord harlan you know his death may have emboldened the tyrells like oh that guy was a hero he's the one that bent the knee to aegon and he's the reason why we're high lords today they probably have a statue of him but it's kind of funny thinking about it like what else would he have done like not only aegon shows up at his doorstep to say to demand his surrender but valerian was there too <laughs> i mean you you kind of give up when you see that i mean the whole the gardeners were wiped out by that dragon <laughs> the north bent the knee they had an army and they bent the knee harlan tyrell standing there's like i don't have an army or you beat our army already like yeah of course he's gonna surrender what else is he gonna do <laughs> so still so I, I would think they were still grateful for the situation but i'm not sure that they look at harlan as some sort of hero uh and they look at him probably you know as an important figure but I don't know. We don't hear him mention much. <laughs> if he had had some great victory in Dorne instead of the army vanishing, then he might oh, be yeah. one of the greatest of ever. That's but a good instead, point. Yeah. That's a good point. So Theo uh, focused on consolidating control over Highgarden, and he hired, he brought in a bunch of septons and maesters to one by one squash everyone else's claim to Highgarden. 
like went through them one by one legally and, and kind of did what had to be done with documentation and all this other stuff to stop any of that before it even got started. It's a really secured Tyrell rule there. So in, in some ways, Theo is more important for Tyrell uh, continu uh, continuing their hold over Highgarden than, than Arlen was. So it, it remained competently run as far as we know for most of the rest of Targaryen era. We're going to have a few examples here. And but it's still coveted by others, even with Theo trying to lock all that down with documentation and quashing other people's claims to Highgarden. It's still coveted. Here's Olena just explaining that to Sansa. <clears throat> you Starks were kings once, the Aarons and the Lannisters as well, and even the Baratheons through the female line. But the Tyrells were no more than stewards until Aegon the Dragon came along and cooked the rightful king of the Reach, on the field of fire. If truth be told, even our claim to Highgarden is a bit dodgy, just as those dreadful Florents are always whining. What does it matter, you ask? And of course it doesn't, except to oafs like my son. <laughs> By the way, that is the only use of the word dodgy in all of oh, the books. <laughs> really? I thought yeah. you were going to say the only word, use of the word oaf. <laughs> Uh, she she she, she says oaf other times. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I believe. But yeah, do, there's the word dodge appears, but not dodgy. Oh, yeah. So that's interesting. No, Olena looked that oh, up. What's that? Did you just see that word and you're like, huh? I looked it up. Yeah, I almost I made that the trivia question. It's like, what word does Olena use that no one else ever? Like, ah, that's not really. That's <laughs> too too even for a yeah. tough question. That's too obscure. <laughs> we can recognize that one word. Even, but I thought maybe because it's in this episode, people would hear it and be like, oh, maybe that's the word. Is it dodgy? <laughs> yeah, but no. Nah, people aren't thinking about the trivia question at the, until I brought it up again, probably. This is deep into the episode. Like, we're like over an hour and a half in here. So yeah. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, there was a trivia question. Yeah, uh, I can't, I'll tell you, I don't know if I can remember what the question was. It was which point. king uh, is said to have painted the Red Mountains or Green Mountains Red. Oh, okay, 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 cool. Okay, so Olena is a little removed from this history and a little less proud of it than she might be because she's not born a Tyrell. She married into the Tyrell family. She's a red wine by birth. She's also downplaying the Tyrell's ancestry a little bit because High Steward of that house contains a lot of power. I mean, they, given who we're talking about, like the High Steward of the Starks, not that powerful. High steward of Highgarden, really powerful because they're just managing so much wealth. I mean, it's, think about all, all, everything Littlefinger was able to do with the crown's wealth, just being in charge of it. There's just the steward of Highgard of, of Winterfell just doesn't have that much wealth that he's managing. Like, there's less opportunity for embezzlement and borrowing money to invest it and paying it back with the proceeds, but keeping the keeping that business, which is something Littlefinger does. He'll borrow money from the crown, start a business then pay the crown back or not pay it back gradually mm -hmm. and keep that business for himself. <laughs> you know, he's like, well, the crown broke even sort of, but I earned, I got a whole new business out of it. So yeah. And the Tyrells had lots of opportunities for that. Some of the, and, and over such a large span, there would have been some of them who capitalized quite a bit on their position, even if some other ones didn't. So that's another factor too, in their prestige or lack thereof is that the Tyrells were never Kings. Right, like the Starks and Aarons and Lannisters and Baratheons and these others, and also they're not as pure-blooded. Of course, this is to us it's a ridiculous thing, but given that the Tyrells began as an Andal house, it's not, you know they don't. It's yes, they're married into the Gardner bloodlines now, but they can't trace their Tyrell male line descent to that. So some of them would be looked. They'd be looked on as maybe half Reachmen or. Yeah, it's something to lower their prestige in the eyes of the really old blood. But that's, again, part of the point from Aegon's perspective. He's like, if he appointed a former royal house, then that they could use that prestige to bring men to their cause. But the Tyrells don't have what used to be kings as a, as a rallying cry. And in fact, the fact that they aren't is a burden, a burden that works to Aegon's favor because the Reach is more distracted by that than they are coming after him. So, yeah. Very important. Yeah, the, the idea that they would be half reachmen after I'm doing the math right in my head real quick. After five generations, <laughs> you know, if an Andal married a, a, a first man, yeah, 
and then went five generations of marrying more first men. At that point, they're 97 (laughs) percent. And we've been like thousands of years. (laughs) Right. Yeah. (laughs) So like these IRLs are. Yeah, it's all the same blood at this point. (laughs) So we also wonder who else has physical connections to High Garden, like Oakhart and Florent already had their own seats that were separate. Uh, You wouldn't want to just bump them up to High Garden. So it's really if you think about the choices Aegon had. Yeah, there aren't as many. So the gardeners rule for thousands of years and they've died out. Ty- the Tyrells will never be able to drum up the support of a house that ancient, given how Westerosi culture works, which also plays into Aegon's hands. Uh, so House Tyrell has to stay loyal as well, because if they lose the support of the throne, the Reach will probably turn on them. And that's a lot of stuff. So it's a bit of a tightrope walk. But on the other hand, they're lords of Highgarden. Like, it's a, if it's a tightrope walk... There's plenty of nets to catch them. As you said, Sean, they can afford to make mistakes because they have so much cushion given their massive wealth, their fertility, their manpower, and their ability to regrow all that if it loses. Like, yeah, they lose an army. Well, they can't put another one in the field right away, but pretty quickly they can, you know? Aegon was known to have made a lot of royal progresses during his long reign as partly to keep the realm, partly to stop even the notion of rebellion before it started. Bringing Balerion around wherever he went has a good way of pacifying people. I'm like, oh, yeah, if we rebel, we got to face that. Okay, that's a good reminder, Aegon. <laughs> and when Aegon started to get older and his, his health declined a bit, his heir, Aenys, started making those progresses instead. And in fact, Aenys was at Highgarden when Aegon the Conqueror died. And he flew off to get anointed and then came back. <laughs> he went back to mm-hmm. Highgarden to accept their submission and all that. How old about, do we know how old Aenys was at that time? He was into his 30s already. He was, uh, he was three when, or he might have only been 29. It was around, he was around 30 or 31, I think. Yeah, because because he was three when, when his mother died, and she died, I think, in 10. So, Aegon in died in 36, so 26 years later, he'd be 29, I guess. Wow, he's my age. <laughs> Ashea we have so and much in common. <laughs> <laughs> you both love culture and music, and you're not big on fighting. And yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Everybody I'm liked Aenys. Like, yeah. not not that the warrior types didn't like him, but all the like everyone else liked him. So yeah, there you go. That fits you. Everybody, everybody likes Ashea. Really important time to to emphasize the Aenys part of the <laughs> not anus. <laughs> yeah, and we're comparing him to. To you, he's anus. But if he's anyone else, he's anus. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so Highgarden can handle a dragon or two as guests more easily than probably any other castle. Like <laughs> dragons eat a lot, but they got a lot of food there. They can certainly afford that bill, unlike uh, other castles, maybe not so easily. A number of dragons have been there over the years. Valerian's been there, as we've seen several times. Dreamfire was there. Melis was there. The Red Queen. Vermithor was there. Other dragons as well too. Uh, let's go to the time of Jaehaerys. Here's a fun moment that we can relate to you via quote. The faith will look askance at any king who thinks to rule without a septum by his side, he announced. Barris had a ready answer. We shall have no lack of septums. Septon Oswick and Septa Isabel will remain with us, and there is a young man coming from Highgarden to see to our library. His name is Barth. Yeah, Septon Barth came from Highgarden. Yeah, yeah, that's an obscure little detail. A lot of y'all probably forgot. I did when I was reading. I was like, oh, yeah, Septon Barth kind of came up. His, his come up was in the libraries of Highgarden. That's where he got noticed for his abilities. Frankly, so- though, that's a good place to get noticed. You know, you want to be in the center of things. Highgarden's famed for its culture and learning. Well, good spot to be. Barth- Do you think Barth was a, a reachman? Or just happened to be placed at Highgarden? I think he was a reachman. Yeah, Yeah, okay. This person that is arguing with Jaehaerys was the previous High Septon that Jaehaerys dismissed. There's evidence to that Barth, Garth, like it's probably a a common name for that area. Oh, yeah. That's a great point, yes. Yes, the Arth. Darth. Darth. (laughs) (laughs) We all know Darth Tyrell. All the the Sith come from the Reach, yeah. (laughs) Karth, you know. Karth. Of course. <laughs> Karth Vader. Uh, Karth Vader. I like it. Garth uh, Vader. Yeah, someone make us a Darth Vader just 
vines and green greenery all over him. That yeah, would I would look, like to see Garth. That's, that's yeah, pretty Garth cool Vader mashup. I would like to see that. I would also like to see Barth Vader though as well. Yes, Barth <laughs> Vader, <laughs> famed for his learning instead of his very short temper. <laughs> um. Yes. Uh, so he says this says really good things about High Garden's libraries, which other people say good things about High Garden's libraries, but and the quality of learning there, etc. But the f- fact that Barth came from there just is a big feather in their cap uh nina suggests maybe he benefited from the scholarship promoted by theo tyrell the one who arranged that council of septons and maesters to dismiss all those claims to high garden in order to solidify tyrell rule there barth wouldn't have been alive during that during theo tyrell's era because i actually he could have been it's possible but i don't think so uh but it would have been not long after his time. So it would have been pretty short that, uh, so Theo's time would have been pretty recent from when Barth was there. So whatever changes he made, bringing all these septons and maesters in, maybe he was like a, a apprentice or an understudy or lack for lack of a better word. I don't know what junior septons are called. <laughs> so someone, a devotee that was working under some older septon and came to high garden along with that. Can Garth I? was lowborn, so maybe not. But still, he made his way up somehow. Can we take a moment for uh, Garth Vader? I wanted to test something yeah. in Adobe Firefly, which is um, it is an AI generation tool, but it technically uses like what's known as vegan or vegetarian data, which is that they uh, have consent for people. Okay. Either way, you can't use this art for much. But oops, I wanted to show I did put. Art of Darth Vader, green and covered in plants and vine. There's our Garth Vader. Whoa. <laughs> I just appreciated that. That looked cool. Yeah, I thought it looked weird. <laughs> anyways, I just was idly curious. But uh, <laughs> anyways, that's, that's from Adobe Firefly, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> in, during the air, uh, reign of Jaehaerys, they had the tourney of the Field of Roses, which is the greatest tourney seen in a generation. And we know High Gardens has a long tradition of tournaments part of the order of the green hand and part of their tradition of encouraging the best and the brightest to show off for high garden, to be uh, worthy and to be part of that greater heart of chivalry. And this would have been maybe the, but this would have possibly been the first time the Tyrells hosted this before it would have been the gardeners and off and on. So this would have been the first time they proceeded over those, uh, proceedings, and that would have probably been a pretty big deal. They would have maybe wanted to really go all out, and I don't want to re- re- relate them to Tywin too much, but Tywin spends his money aggressively to show the prestige and power of his house, and I feel like if you're if if you're ever going to do that, it would be a time like this when your house is newly in power, and you want to remind people that you're not weak. They say we we are newly empowered. That doesn't mean we're weak. We that new power is quite stout. Moving on to the Dance of the Dragons, the Tyrell were in a conundrum, wanting to support the dragons as they always had, given this loyalty to Aegon, but time had passed. But which one is the right one to support? Like, who is the correct dragon side to follow? So they used the excuse that they had a boy lord and would remain neutral. And this is, of course, important. Because the high towers are green, so you really would expect the Tyrells to be on the green side, and the high towers were kind of expecting their liege lords to back them, but they had no choice but to accept that the Tyrells were going to remain neutral. Because what did we say in the first part of the episode? You're constantly sending your children to High Garden when you're a lesser vassal, even if you're a really powerful house, because that's the way to get closer to power, and because they kind of demand it of you, and because you get better training there. So there's a lot of reasons to do it. And that was exactly what happened here. The Lord Hightower of the era, which it's different TV versus show, which Lord Hightower it was. It doesn't really matter for our purposes here. His younger brother, Garmond, was at Highgarden during the dance, before the dance broke out and during the dance as a page. So they basically had a Highgarden. They basically had a Hightower hostage at Highgarden. So what are you going to do? They're like, you should fight for us. Nope. Okay then, <laughs> darn it! They can't. Yeah, they're just like, all right, start, ah, they can't do anything. So, moving past the dance to the era of the young dragon, again, since it's an invasion of Dorne and High Gardens got such manpower and their loyalty to the 
crown is famous and important to holding on to their own power, they were very likely heavily involved with making this campaign happen. It was Lord Lionel Tyrell put in charge of Dorne afterwards, remember? So he was probably, uh, if not the most crucial supporter, one of the most crucial supporters in terms of supplying manpower and w money and weapons and all that for this invasion. But this guy, if you forget Lionel Tyrell, he was the scorpion bed guy. <laughs> so he obviously met his end in Dorne as well. A nastier end, maybe, than dying in the desert of... Eh, I guess that's nastier. Yeah, I think the scorpion thing will be over quicker. That's poison. Yeah, I think I'd rather die that way. Let's not linger on that, though. There <laughs> it is, the famous scorpion moment. Oh. NSFW hey. picture there, huh? <laughs> With Jeff dead. <laughs> dead Brendan Jeff. Beefish. That, yes. was, that was Brendan Beefish dead Yeah. Uh, on that bed. <laughs> dead and naked. <laughs> <laughs> but, and of course, it wasn't. So another Lord of High Garden killed in Dorne, another Tyrell Lord killed in Dorne, and of course, Daron himself <laughs> was, was dead a couple years later as well. So that didn't go very well. Skipping ahead to the next Daron, which is, what, 27 years later? No, 24 years later. Daron, Daron the Good. Uh, Nina writes, I'd be willing to bet Leo Tyrell, Leo Longthorn was Lord of High, High Garden at this time, may have, must, might have staged some impressive tourneys at High Garden, given he himself was known to be a talented and famous jouster. Imagine that. You're a young Lord of High Garden, the place where... It's known where the most of the tournaments are thrown or it's famous for tournaments and you're good at jousting and you got all this money. Yeah. Nina's probably right here. This guy was like, let's throw another tournament, y'all, and I'm going to enter. Like, that seems like a <laughs> conflict of interest, but what, who's going to tell him no? Who's going to stop him, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nina also wonders if Damon Blackfire ever visited Highgarden. He probably did. I mean, uh, the Highgarden, uh, the reach was stout for for Damon Blackfire, even though High Garden specifically wasn't. Uh, he stayed out of the war until the end and started, then fought against Damon. Uh, so he was one of the few lords of the Reach to not go against, to fight, uh, to not go Blackfire, which was unusual because so much of the Reach fought for Damon, but not unusual given that. This isn't like the Dance of the Dragons where it's two halves of House Targaryen. This is Targaryen versus Blackfire, so the Tyrell loyalty is a little more straightforward. That said, Leo was not a big help to the dragons. He mostly just stayed in the Reach, and he was kind of a little F Walder Frey-ish with his support. Like, uh, I'm going to help, but just barely. It's simply not being against them is a help. Yeah, right? considering how powerful they are, yeah. But mostly you can you can tell he's like I'd rather like he's more in more uh, invested in tournaments than real war. <laughs> <laughs> so good, good yeah, job. Yeah, Everyone good. else should have <laughs> been also. <laughs> that's that's a good thing. You're right. Dunk did visit Highgarden while he was young as a squire to Sir Arlen. Of course, that's where all the places he went when young were because of Sir Arlen because he was in Flea Bottom before that and not mobile at all. So this was probably around the year 200, 201, maybe 202 based on what we know about where he was. And if we go back too much farther than that, he's too young, right? Because he's 17 or 16-ish at the beginning of, in the year 209. So guessing he was 10, 12-ish around when he went to High Garden. Uh, the, in the Song of Ice and Fire era, Sam has been there, of course. I mean, he was a vassal and uh, for a while the heir to... Uh, Horn Hill, which is a vassal of Highgarden and not super far away. Hey, Horn Hill is, if not the closest, one of the closest castles to Highgarden. Certainly, right? major castle. Yeah, yeah. There's probably yeah. some lesser ones in the way that they don't, some of them don't even make the map. But yeah, absolutely. Horn Hill is a significant one, and no, you're right, not very far. So, and Nina says it's specifically Lord Randall would bend the knee to Lord Tyrell, and Sam would go. Uh, Sam's memory is evidence that the Tyrells did not forget this. Like, that they still do this. They still have vassals bending the knee to the High Lord. You don't just bend the knee to the king. You still, you offer fealty to your High Lord as well. So the, the ancient traditions still there. Uh, 
established by the gardeners, still happening at High Garden, even even though it's under a different house. Arianne wanted to go to High Garden to meet Willis, <laughs> but Doran said no because you know he had his whole master plan in play. Sansa, of course, wanted to go as well to marry Willis, <laughs> for, you know, but the Lannisters nixed that. So lots of nixing of High Garden trips going on here. Will not if. What's that? He said, will not. <laughs> yes. Yeah, will no. not us, yes. Yeah, no. <laughs> will? No. Your last Willis and Testament. Renly <laughs> and Loras flee King's Landing together after Ned refuses Renly's offer of help during the potential coup. Renly then weds Marjorie at Highgarden and marches for Bitterbridge, then Storm's End. Of course, that's again where the cruel prank against Brienne was happening at the same time as all this. A peach was offered to Stannis by Renly in that famous scene. The peach, of course, came from Highgarden. Renly specifically points that out. It's used as a symbol in a somewhat similar manner to Robert describing the bounty of the Reach to Ned. Renly throws it in Stannis' face like, this represents my allies. I have this. You know, all the fertility and power of the Reach is behind me. Here's that quote. It's such a fun moment. Renly's hand slid inside his cloak. Stannis saw and reached at once for the hilt of his sword, but before he could draw steel, his brother produced a peach. Would you like one, brother? Renly asked, smiling. From Highgarden? You've never tasted anything so sweet, I promise you. Took a bite. Juice ran from the corner of his mouth. That yes. embellishment by George Juice running from the corner of his mouth, it's so intentional. Like, just this peach. It's a really important peach, y'all. Can I say? <laughs> a peach I from the reach. I very purposefully gave Sean this quote because I knew I could not keep it together if I tried to read that out loud. And then I still broke in high art, so who knows? I, I mean, I that. But no, the whole time you're reading that, I'm like, how did you do that, Sean? You were so serious. <laughs> and so there's a lot of ways that the power of Highgarden is shown, symbolically through fruit and the juice running down Renly's cheek. But also... When Catelyn is a guest of Renly to negotiate with him after Rob is named king. Now, she, Catelyn is very high-born. She's no stranger to being treated well, right? It's what she's used to. But even she is blown away by how fancy Renly's pavilion and how upscale the accommodations are, despite, or in, or in part because of, it's on campaign. Like, they're marching to war, and it's they're still, like, fully decked out in all the finery, and have all the luxuries that you wouldn't expect to have on campaign. But that's part of the point. They're like, just like High Garden, just taunts would be attackers with its openness, being like, look, you couldn't take us anyway. Like, yeah, we're not, we're so powerful. We don't have to focus on defense because we're so strong. This is really being reflected here as well. Like, can we we're so wealthy and powerful. We don't have to treat this like a war. <laughs> we can take our time holding tournaments, just expressing our power, marching slowly up the king's road while also letting the other people fight each other. So it's it's not all about that. Multi Imagine player. though if they had treated it like a war with all that they power probably would like have won. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. <laughs> sure you can rest on your laurels, but it doesn't mean you should rest on your laurels. Yep, yep. I mean, to be fair, they couldn't have possibly seen the shadow coming. But other, so the other things could have gone wrong. It's not like this was the one thing that could go wrong. It's like, oh, we got so unlucky. The only thing that could have gone wrong there was. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and here's a, a two-liner quote that just further explains what we're saying here. This was Caitlin mm -hmm. talking about the yeah. friendly camp. Looking at how much what she has presented to her. The food, there was plenty. Or had not touched the fabled bounty of Highgarden. The fabled bounty of Highgarden. It's so bountiful, it's expressed as if it's unreal, as a fable, but they believe in it. <laughs> it's a quote from there, that quote turns into one of George's famous food descriptions. I decided not to just have the whole thing, but it's just a list of food. Like Catelyn goes about to list all the foods. Mm -hmm. So yeah. If I were to if we were to read that, we'd all get hungry because it sounds pretty good. <laughs> Meanwhile, Compare that to when Asha gets back to the Iron Isles, the steward of Harlaw, which is the richest Iron Island's house, is a singularly ancient woman named Three Tooth who tells Asha the kitchens are closed. <laughs> Asha, Asha Greyjoy is told the kitchens are closed. Like, well, Asha grabs her ear and is like, no, they're not. And she's like, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. 
to, she has to like pinch her ear to get hot food for her captives and men and and it, it, they do that but this goes to show like this is they don't have I, I, the kitchens at high guard probably never shut down <laughs> yeah it's a different scale it's just a different world that they live in here. yeah yeah so it's just it's really something else so after renly is dead there's a lot of confusion, right? Different elements of Renly's army go different places. Different lords and ladies do different things. They're not sure who they're going to follow now. And a lot of that chaos happens at Bitterbridge. Here's the SSM, the Sospeak Martin, George's direct quote about what happened, which is going to relate to our topic today. It would be hugely overstating to say there was a battle, but there was definitely much confusion and conflict when word reached them of Renly's death. At that point, and in the days that followed, as rival envoys began to arrive, Renly's foot ceased to be a hole and became more a gathering of feudal levies, each of which had to make its own decision as to what to do now. Presume some fighting. Presume that a lot of people just decided this might be a swell time to go home. <laughs> but most of them ultimately wound up with the Tyrell slash Lannister alliance. Crane and Florent are presently captives at Highgarden, by the way. Yeah, so Crane and Florent are Parman Crane and Aaron Florent. Parman Crane was, if I recall correctly, one of Renly's Rainbow Knights. And the Cranes are important regardless. The Florents are even more important. So being, Nina says, Aaron Florent being a captive at Highgarden may end up saving his life and may even put him in line to inherit Brightwater Keep, which is the Florence seat of power. Right now, Brightwater Keep has been granted to Garland Tyrell, Willis' younger brother, Loras' older brother, but he doesn't, he's not in possession of it. He's, he was building an army to go take it and make it his when Euron attacked the shields. So he's like, oops, that's a higher priority. Let's gather even more men because it's going to be harder to take the shields back, especially because they have to take ship to get there. So that's what he's doing right now. Garland's doing that. So Garland may not survive the series. And if that's the case, then the Florence might get restored to their ancestral seat. And this one guy sitting in, in prison because ever since the death of Renly might be the one that ends up on top. Like, like, um, like sort of like what Varus might have been planning for uh, Ty, Ty, Tyrek Lannister, who vanished during the riots, assuming Tyrek is even with Varus. But... That is, that is a similar, that theory fits here for what they might have wanted to stash in air for their own purposes. Well, this isn't that, but it could work out the same way in essence. So, Alicane Florent is in Old Town. He's the, uh, the other major Florent around because Al Axel Florent's at the wall, <laughs> you know, with Stannis' army. So, yeah. Nina says, all hail Lord Aaron. It could be, <laughs> it could be him. So, yeah. Uh -huh. Regarding, this, is, this also brings us back to the food supply thing. Uh, the riots, again, with, I just mentioned Tyrick Lannister, so that a lot of factors are conf uh, bringing us back to that um, little story. But let's not forget it was the Tyrells that choked off the food supply in the first place. <laughs> they choked off that food supply, and then they stopped doing that when Renly died, and then brought food, and everybody saw them as heroes, because people didn't know that it was them who caused the starvation in the first place. But dang, that's a lot of food. Like, they just stored that food at Highgarden and brought it up. Some of it might have been ordered from their vassals, but, like, the food was just coming straight up the Rose Road from Highgarden. So, just huge, of just unbelievable amounts of food, really. Also, in Clash of Kings, after Renly's death, as well, Littlefinger travels there to negotiate the marriage of Joffrey and Marjorie, right? And he later tells Sansa... Littlefinger does, how he bribed the Highgarden musicians to sing of the Kingsguard in order to fire up Loras about the idea because they were going to try to push him into that and they wanted to like lay some groundwork about their bravery. Consider that Sansa, again, I keep using the Starks as an example because we know more about them than any other house. Sansa, there's that anecdote where she loves music, but singers rarely come to Winterfell. Singers rarely come to Winterfell, but... At Highgarden, they've got a whole freaking batch of musicians on staff at all times that Littlefinger can bribe to sing what he wants, which is like 
God, <laughs> like, this is the, <laughs> the disparity here is a lot larger than I think a lot of y'all may have realized. It's certainly bigger than I realized digging into deep, digging deeper into it at every different angle that we have here from staff, from the land, from the politics. Just it's quite different. It's a little bit of a tangent, but I, I think about this a lot, how much we take for granted music these days that like and, you know, not like a thousand years ago, but even a hundred years ago, even the wealthiest people in the world, music was a special treat. It was not yeah. it's just literally any song ever existed is literally at our fingertips now. We just instantly hear it anytime we want. But a hundred years ago, the richest people in the world would still have to coordinate and figure out how to hear a song and be a special event, you know. Coordinate. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Good pun, Sean. <laughs> Chord, get it? Music. Chord. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Yeah, you're really just stuck with singing. That's the only, you know, it's, and maybe percussion, you know, random tapping of things on other things. And maybe you make a flute or something like that. I hear a the music flute. in everyday life in nature. <laughs> I would have heard the song of our people every day. So I don't know about you, Sean. <laughs> I kind of like how this map works here. Like, it's it's, a, it's dark on, on my left, but on the right, it's like the reach is emerging from my my skull or my shoulder. From your shadow. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Who's the real king of the reach? <laughs> so that we can extrapolate from the fact that they have musicians, lots of them on staff, that they have other huge amounts of staff. We talk about the garden crew that must be there. Nina mentions the horses. If Willis, own, Willis owns the best horses in the Seven Kingdoms, apparently, according to his letters to Oberyn Martell, which he then relates to Tyrion. How many, what's the staff like? What's the upkeep? On the finest horses. You probably have the finest, uh, what are they called? Um, ostlers. That's right. A guy who works with horses. In the Seven Kingdoms, too. They could certainly afford to pay for the fine. Like, you work for this lord? You're a great horse. I'm going to pay you more to come to Highgarden. What are they going to do? Say no? I doubt it. <laughs> They'll probably be like, yes, my lord. I don't want to say no because you're the high lord. But also, you're paying me more and I'm going to live in a better house. Like, yeah, right? I mean, I get to live at Highgarden? With their awesome library, that's what I'd be thinking about. I'd be like, I get to go to that library? Yeah. <laughs> and the hawking, right? There's, there's another example. These guys, you know they're hawking because they do that. So who keeps the birds? Who takes care of the birds? They're not doing it themselves. Willis Tyrell's not checking in on his hawk every morning, feeding it. No, that's some servants doing that, right? But some high-paid, well-trained, well-dressed, well-groomed servant is doing that. That's the other thing, probably. Like, they're also wearing gold and have fancy clothes even though they're servants these are high garden servants and high garden servants need to look as fancy as everything else in the castle it just wouldn't do to have them look grubby while everything else looks nice would it i'm trying to think like a really wealthy person <laughs> you know that's another thing we take for granted is food that food is just any type of food from anywhere in the world we just have it all the time everywhere that most people from most of history spent the hours of their days toiling for food. And so if food is plentiful in High Garden, then people have time to specialize in other things, to train and focus and learn and, uh, you know, diversify the, the, the sort of talents that exist around High Garden that are, are probably greater than around Winterfell. You know? Yeah, I agree. I mean, Winterfell does have a great, uh, an awesome library, but as we saw, it wasn't well staffed. Because the dude just walked in there and burned it. <laughs> Some random guy off the street <laughs> who wasn't even all there mentally. Like, he was able to accomplish that. Like, I don't think that would happen at Highgarden. They'd be like, wait, who are you? Weird, grubby guy? Like, <laughs> what's going on here? Uh, so, yeah, just very different. Um, and I love that this is expressed very early on in the series. George immediately draws these comparisons and then fills them out over time. Like, you know, it doesn't fully sink in from Robert's quote, but it does tell you a lot. Like you just got done seeing Winterfell. You saw a feast there and how it wasn't like super, it was nice, but it wasn't super fancy, right? The, the food descriptions of all the food descriptions you see throughout A Song of Ice and Fire, that first feast at Winterfell, it's a little muted, right? It isn't all, he, George slow rolls that to show you the bigger feasts, at more fancier locales later. Who are the people that are there? Uh, in addition to those prisoners we mentioned, Olena Tyrell is back there now. She's with Willis, so that's good for Willis <laughs> that she's there. She's less likely, he's less likely to maybe do something dumb with her advice, you know, whispering in, in his ear. 
Probably. I mean, it's possible she makes a mistake. It's possible she steers him wrong. But she's less likely to make a mistake than, say, Mace Tyrell, who is at King's Landing doing his business and being all proud and foolish. Uh, a certain Sir Egon Verwell is captain of the guards at Highgarden. It's not clear whether he's at Highgarden right now, though he might be with Mace Tyrell. Olena does have her guards, Eric and Ark, no relation to the Cargill Knights of the Dance of the Dragons era, but they are named for those two, and they are also seven feet tall. So You know, are... who, who, who else names their children, their twins, and is like, you know, let's, let's name them after tragic twins <laughs> who killed each other. Like, I'm really inspired by this tale. Like, that's a great thing to... Yeah, let's hope that happens that, to them. Yeah, that mother and father. <laughs> Adding to the already difficult nature of telling them apart. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she Those calls them left and right. Very similar names that are <laughs> terrible connotation. Yeah. So, uh, how staffed with soldiers is High Garden right now? The answer is not very because of that strength going to the shields. I think they might still be at High Garden right now, but they're getting ready to leave to go to the shields to try to retake those. So there will be if if they're not already over there. They will be depleted of soldiers pretty soon, which opens things up for the f so-called friends of the Reach, the friends of Aegon the Sixth and John Connington and Illyrio and Varys. They don't know they're friends with Illyrio and Varys, but <laughs> that's who's behind all this. And so, if someone goes after the Florence, the Brightwater Keep, or because Randall Tarley once Randall Tarley wanted Flor uh, uh, Florence for himself, the castle Brightwater Keep for himself, he was mad that Mace gave it to his son instead of him. And he has a, a reasonable complaint. His wife is a Florent. So he feels like it's, you know, it's, it's closer to his family in that sense. So he was upset at that, which is one of the many reasons why Randall Tarly may turn on his, his high lord, uh, turn on his, uh, his high, turn on the Tyrells and become part of the Aegon faction. And he would presumably want Brightwater Keep as part of his reward. He may also be a crucial leader against the Tyrells, considering he's a, a military veteran, tough, brutal leader, capable enough. So that's a strong possibility there. Another person that's at High Garden right now is Osbert Sari. He's one of the Lords of the Shields. It was his son killed by Victorian in that duel we saw in uh, where Victorian's hand gets hurt. So that was his heir that he killed. So Osbert Sari is, of course, quite upset with the Ironborn, so are all the Lords of the Shields and just all the Reach folk in general, but especially the, the Lords of the Shields. So that's that's relevant. We don't know in what way just yet, but it, it'll come up. So the army could be away, far away when it's needed most, either not just Highgarden being a threat, but Euron attacking Old Town. Like, if they're literally on the Shield Islands when Euron strikes Old Town, that's perfect for Euron and terrible for them. Like, talk about being outmaneuvered. Like, even if they magically knew it happened that instant, yeah, they still have to get on boats and sail over and then get off the boats. It'll take forever to respond to that. Yeah. And part of what Euron did was to draw their attention away from the shields. It's like he's going to draw their attention away from the shields to take them, and then that draws their attention to the shields so he can take something else. What he did was he sent men up the Mander all the way up as far as Bitterbridge to raid and reeve to get the attention of Highgarden, who then deployed ships and river vessels and put everybody on high alert which opened up the attack on the shields. So Highgarden is being spread thin by all these events, which is creating that confluence of events we described during the sack of Highgarden when the Dornish king was successful there. Saying, y'all, a lot of these conditions are very similar, and it doesn't even take those conditions given we have dragons. It could just be that. It could be Danny's like, nope, gotta burn you. Or... It burns for some other reason. She doesn't have to be the one to burn it, but it's very burnable. It's very flammable, shall we say? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's wildfire. Green nature going up in green fire. I don't know why that would happen, but eh, it's an interesting mental image. <laughs> so we haven't seen it. We've, seen, we've heard a lot about it. We hear about it very frequently. People talk about it. It's the center of news in the South. In 2006, George R. R. Martin said, we definitely see Caster Lock and we may see High Garden. And I got to think, since 2006, the story has expanded quite a bit. Uh, this is a post A Feast for Crows quote, so only one book has come since then. But 
that's when a lot of that expansion happened, you know, in between while he's rewriting the five-year gap into, well, something that didn't exist. And yeah, there's a lot of possibility here for going there. We might see, George did say there won't be any new POVs, but again, Danny could go there. John Connington could go there. Um, Sam could go there. Sam. Yeah, it's a big one. Sam, big possibility there. And there's always a possibility of a prologue chapter there. I doesn't seem the most likely spot for one or an epilogue chapter. So even though he said he wouldn't add new multi POVs, that he'll still have one offs in the prologues and maybe epilogues. He didn't he didn't say he wouldn't do that. Now House Tyrell is an episode an episode for another day. They're a whole story onto their own that's separate from Highgard in some ways, even though they're inextricably tied to it. But they no longer have the qualities that caused Aegon the Conqueror to choose them as Lords of the Reach. They no longer have the skills they had as high stewards for generations that skill set is now in the hands of their high stewards who i don't know who that is actually <laughs> but <laughs> whoever that is it's not the tyrell so someone else is in charge of day-to-day -day affairs and maybe has been for about 300 years so like, maybe that will maybe everything's history coming up bushy <laughs> everything's coming up bushy <laughs> <laughs> that's the new hedge cannon that the bushies will <laughs> Ascend to Highgarden. They've got the name for it. They yeah. do have the name for it. I mean, what does Tyrell even mean? That doesn't... Bushy is right on topic, though. Yeah. So I think Willis Tyrell is not unlikely to end up as Lord before it's all done because Mace Tyrell is not, doesn't seem like a survivor. He's just making all sorts of bad decisions. He's too proud. He's too arrogant. I don't know that Willis will survive either, though. It's possible they both die. I, I certainly figure if, I, if only one of them survives, I would pick Willis pretty easily pretty handily i mean i could see myself being wrong but it seems like a safe bet of the two and especially with olena there giving him advice where olena advice was mostly not listened to by mace <laughs> so further exacerbating his foolishness and and red flagging him for a <laughs> future doom probably willis in charge i mean he seems competent but we don't really know that much about him so and he may be left with things in a bad spot if, if Mace's decisions cause a lot of problems for him before he's able to take charge. Not to mention Cersei, right? Cersei and Tywin have treated Highgarden very differently. Tywin understood that the, you can't just make an enemy of Highgarden lightly. Like, you have to kind of accept them. It's better to have them as an ally, even if they're encroaching, even if they're trying to take all these offices and grabbing power where they can, even though there's so darn many of them. <laughs> you still can't that's why you shouldn't make an enemy of them but Cersei doesn't see it that way Cer Tywin's goal is to bring them in the fold but keep them secondary keep them one level lower whereas Cersei's like no we're gonna make enemies of them which will probably backfire but may cause the doom of both of their houses he may bring both of them bring them both down together and Cersei doesn't have Tywin or even Kevin in her way to stop that so who knows? But she does have a lot of high garden bannermen around her. So there is that, which, but they may not stay high garden bannermen. If they don't stay high garden bannermen, they probably won't be hers, though. They'll probably join Aegon. So, yeah. Uh, Nina, by the way, does expect Sam will flee to high garden. She thinks that when Euron attacks Old Town, and she thinks when, not if, because, yeah, I agree with that. It is a when, not an if. That is a good place to go. Uh, with Gilly, of course, and maybe even with Sor uh, Sorella along, too. That would be interesting. So exciting to see Willis Tyrell. Yeah. So Highgarden would be the natural heart of resistance to Euron. If anyone's going to take back Old Town in the short term, it would be them. And certainly they'd be the, in, it would be their duty to do that. Uh, so this is where Willis may... Uh, be a valuable character to put on screen because he's going to have a lot in common with Sam. Sam might get along with Willis in ways that he wouldn't have ever gotten along with Mace or Loras or Leo Tyrell, who he's, uh, you know, associated with down there at the Citadel. So Willis, soft-spoken, friendly, empathetic, good-natured Willis could get along with Sam. So yeah, maybe it's too much to hope for, but I think it's really strong possibilities. Obviously, Nina believes so as well. So we may get some Sam Willis friendship and that could be really cool. Uh, we'll see. But we'll, it but makes sense to me that Sam and Willis would become good friends, and then Martin kills Willis. That's <laughs> <laughs> that does make sense. Yeah, and then Sam goes back to John, you know, or something. So, 
what what I'm what I was getting at before before we got sidetracked with some other interesting points here is that history could repeat itself. Danny is got all kinds of egg on the conqueror vibes coming from coming in as a bit of an outsider, bringing in a foreign army, big black dragon, having to reestablish herself. It's kind of like a second conquest. If the Tyrells are her enemies, which they probably will be, then she may promote their stewards to the place of high lords after them and you know push the tyrells completely aside i don't see them all dying there's just too darn many of them but they could be set down uh a peg or just you know kicked out entirely exiled or something the, the one knock against that is that we don't even know who their stewards are right now so that's a good point that's a good point so maybe not their stewards but maybe some of the house maybe maybe Harley's, maybe Sam, maybe, I don't know. Uh, Flippy Dippy Doo says, not n- saying I think this is the case, but just to note the only other Barths we've heard of were Northmen. And then Nina replied and said, I mean, there's also a Rickard Tyrell. Uh, so Some it, names as a popular. first man type name, mm-hmm. potentially. Mm-hmm. That's uh, true. But that's notable. A, that's an interesting diversion because the, the, the Reach would have first man traditions and first man names and and all names whereas the north never got as andalized uh, although they did yeah. somewhat i mean it's just names they're not like oh that's an andal name you know over time that distinction might lose some of its uh well it might lose some distinction over time okay folks that is high garden for you a lot to say a lot to think about a lot to predict a lot still coming definitely curious where it's going to end up and the fate of not only House Tyrell, but the castle itself, who's going to hold it at the end, and what about their vassals, whether Highgarden will still be a, a place of fertility, or whether that will be a thing of the past, whether it be a thing for them to rebuild. Part of the dream of spring might be rebuilding Highgarden. The blooms returning would be an appropriate place for that rebirth to begin in the south, even while the north has its own struggles and differences. It being so far away, we'd probably... In a dream of spring, when we're seeing sort of an outro, an epilogue to the entire story, having word of or talk of High Garden would really make a lot of sense. Given High Garden's doing well, then the realm might do okay. Like if High Garden's flourishing, then that can provide a lot of support for a lot of people in what will likely be difficult times post winter, post others, post however many civil wars you want to lay at the feet of the different lords and ladies and kings and queens. The answer to our trivia question. A Lord Hightower once claimed the Red Mountains were green until a certain king invaded and painted them with Dornish blood. What king was that? The the answer is almost in the question. Garth the Painter. (laughs) Another painter, yes. So he was the king. Garth? Yeah, a Garth. Garth the Painter? Yeah, so he took over. He was the king that I said that after the, the Tyrells resettled uh the the sack of of high garden and got it all going again it was a descendant of the new king the co- second cousin of the dead king the tyrells placed in charge i think it was myrn the sixth myrn the sixth son or grandson or great-grandson was this uh garth the painter who was determined to get revenge for the destruction of the oaken seed and the burning of high garden and all that and apparently he did so given that quote he painted the the green mountains red uh so mm-hmm. kind of an interesting name kind of a, i don't know what word to use ironic name but it seems like oh he's this artsy guy he's a painter no he paints with blood yes. yeah <laughs> he really paints in one color <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he doesn't and it's not real paint yeah he goes hard in the paint he goes hard in the paint <laughs> <laughs> garth jordan yeah. oh so you did know it was a, okay I didn't know it was a basketball reference until last night. Going hard in the paint? Yeah, that is yeah, a basketball reference. Yeah, I just thought reference. it was a rap thing. And then I was like, that was like, explained to me that that was a basketball reference. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, so you'd know. Yes. Mentioned other episodes we mentioned that would be relevant to this one or dire- uh, connected to it in one way or another. Septon Barth episode, for one. Um, House Manderley, both parts, but especially part one, which deals with their time in the South. Part two is, is mostly about them being in the North after having moved. You want to check those out and tune in next week for the episode on Nath, Noth, however you want to say it. 
Again, it won't be a live stream. Nah. Nah. <laughs> no, you gotta do it. You gotta do it. Just can you do nah. it? Okay, thank nah. you. Nah. Oh, yeah, nah. That was yours. I want to point out, by the way, that I, I thought the nah were pronounced. Also, Mern came up a few times. It almost sounds like a, the there's a stutter in the connection. <laughs> Mern. Uh. <laughs> Mern. Mern. Uh. What you talking about, Mern? Mm. You got Mern and they got Mern and Willis. We're but yeah, Willis. that episode, the the Nath episode, will be uh, a live premiere, so you can still tune in and have your live chats. But we will not be able to reply to live chats. But that's still right. community uh, and all that. And then please come join me for Street Fighter tonight. Yeah, join the chat for Street Fighter if tonight. If you're listening later, it'll be on the, the replay, the, the VOD or whatever will be on Twitch for whatever, a week yeah. after. So you could still watch it over. As well as my CK3 streams, yeah. which have been Tywin Lannister lately. We're building a big burgeoning proto-empire in the West, trying to get big and wealthy and strike mm. out and be independent. Lots of, of fun things happening in that stream. Aziz's uh, CK3 streams also live on our YouTube on, in an unlisted uh, video, but if you go to our playlist for Crusader Kings 2 and 3, you can see all the unlisted episodes. That's what that's our little trick for that, yeah. is we, we make them unlisted, and then if you go to a playlist, you they're listed there. Playlisted, that's right. So. Uh, you can still watch those back as well. There's two episodes in that Tywin Lannister campaign so mo so far. Yep. So, yeah. That's right. We'll be continuing that for the time being and then eventually restarting with a different house. Uh, CK3 still in beta, so our, um, we'll get, basically still getting our feet wet with all of it. But it's beautiful the way it looks. It's, it's great. The people who came uh, these last few Fridays have been really having a great time. So you might consider joining us. Mm-hmm. There's a poll going on our Patreon for um, what time you might want to join us for Quiplash or Trivia on a monthly hangout session. Yeah. Uh, so just if you, know, if you feel like voting or saying that none of those times work for you, that is particularly relevant for us to know if there's a significant portion of you who could just never make it yeah. to those times. We'd really like to know that. So, okay. That's right. So we're that's part of our planning and, and scheduling and getting all that set so figuring out how many people will be there and all that but mostly we'll just do it by trial hopefully not much error but a <laughs> bit of trial thank you to anyone who supports us on patreon or through spotify subscription we uh really rely on that without uh, without y'all we would uh, not be able to do this full time and that enables us to spend a lot of work keeping ourselves immersed in the material and thinking about it and planning and, and doing a lot of behind the scenes stuff that y'all don't see a lot of work goes into, for example, just managing our back catalog. It's the bigger it gets, the more work that is managing backups. And, and whenever something changes, something we have to modify like 300 old episodes to change that. And oh, God, <laughs> that's like nightmare. That happens. Something like that yeah. happens. And it's like, oh, okay. Yep. We have a lot of episodes that then need to all be changed. There's Anyways. Certainly a lot. Some podcasts really are just people getting in front of a mic and talking. We are not that sort of podcast. We, uh. Yeah, no, I had a funny thing <laughs> where a friend of mine asked me, like, for help with podcasting, like, asked what our outline, like, like what's a sample outline look like? What's a sample format? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think I'm the person you want mm -hmm. to, like, model yourself after. And I, like, sent her a video of a document. And I was like, this is a 20-page document. I don't yeah. think you need that. But, like, if you really wanted to see my outline, this is it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> This one, for example, for this episode was 22 pages. Yeah, 22 <laughs> pages. And uh, I mean, it's quotes and text, but like, I don't think there's a lot of, like, there's not a lot of, like, like the formatting is pretty tight. It's not like it's 22 loose pages. To, yeah, you know. there, I have section yeah. headers and, yeah, and like organized that, by but, chronology. And, but yeah. like, if you tightened it to like be as compact as you could without like section headers or something, it's still like going to be 18 pages. 18 pages, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, cool. Well, yeah, so... Which, incidentally, patrons have access to these documents, right? Yeah. That's true. Good call, Sean. Indeed, we do. We give access to all our documents, new and old. And that's a lot of documents. So, yeah, folks, if you want to sign up, support us on Patreon or on uh, Spotify subscription, that would be great. We would really appreciate it. It enables us to uh, get all the things done that we need to get done. So, hopefully, I've given you an insight into some of the behind-the-scenes work. I'm sure we'll... Uh, explore some of that at another time but for now thank you for coming thank you for listening thank you for watching thanks to nina for her great notes i know i say this almost every time but they were particularly strong today 
I would like you to say they were particularly weak today, actually. <laughs> I've yet to, feel, I've yet to feel that way. I know. I can't imagine you saying that. <laughs> that would be a... funny. People were like, what? Like, I'm just kidding. No, they were great. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Joey, Jesse, and Bran, thanks to y'all for your, uh, your contributions via our music and, and editing. And to Michael Clarfeld as well for that. And Extra Maps. big thanks to, Mike, thanks to Michael today. We used lots of his art. Yes, indeed. And to the Benjineer for sound quality assistance as well. He's still in the fold working with us. And yes. we are grateful for that. All Look right, folks. my ass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You were playing fighting games with I him last night. Him, I played Ben not in Street Fighter, but in Tekken last night. And he's really good. For context, my prowess in Tekken is almost 10,000. That's how much practice I've had. His prowess in Tekken is almost 60,000. So that just the numbers don't need to mean much to you, but you can tell that he's six times better than me easily. Uh, anyway, or more experience, maybe not better, but more experience. Anyways, you ben need a couple of peaches, reach peaches, and that'll yeah, even things hope, out. Yeah, I hope he's, he's listening as he edits this a little bit and he hears us saying his phrases. He's like, "Yeah, that's right, I did kick your ass." <laughs> He'll just record a, little, a few lines to stick in there that we will yeah. know. About. <laughs> yeah, I kicked your ass. That is not what his voice sounds like at all. That would be funny. <laughs> that would actually be very, uh, very amusing. Aziz will find out because Aziz does another pass where he edits. Our, our episodes are quite edited, y'all. Like Ben goes through and then Aziz goes through too. So Yeah, uh, I, I edit the whole thing. I mean, he, he does the sound quality, but then I do the like editorial, cutting certain lines out and things yeah. like that. So, yep. yep. That's why sometimes it isn't out till the afternoon on Monday rather than Monday early morning because I usually get the file around 9 or 10 p.m. and then I takes me till about four or five in the morning to finish yes sometimes i have to sleep first (laughs) anyway folks thanks again for for everything uh for listening watching supporting etc i already said that but i'm gonna say it again because we're that appreciative and we'll see you next time for more till then you know what to do valar reread us